going to get started now. Um, so please take your seats. And my name is Carol Zaman. I want to welcome you to today. We're thrilled at the turnout and the variety of people that have come to be with us today to talk about workforce needs in energy efficiency, distributed generation, and demand response, which is still a mouthful for me. Um, but those are the sectors that we're focusing on here. Um, as you know, this summit is really part of a year-long research process um, for doing the California Workforce Education and, tra and, and Training Needs Assessment for the state. It was called for in our long-term energy efficiency strategic plan, and the Don Vial Center at UC Berkeley was awarded the contract along with our partners, the Community College Centers for Excellence and Research into Action. The final report will be released in February, so what you have in your packets are our key findings and our preliminary recommendations. And really the point of today is to talk about those recommendations and findings and to have a collective discussion of the themes that surfaced as we talked to many, many, many people around the state uh, of, about workforce issues in energy efficiency and related sectors. Um, so for us, this day is really about learning from you, getting feedback, and we hope that the conversations amongst you is fruitful for you guys as well. Um, you're also welcome to email us with comments on the report because it isn't final. Um, the conference is structured to highlight what we've learned in the morning and present research results, and then in the afternoon, sessions will be, um, the breakout sessions will be about the key themes that surfaced as we talk to folks around the state. So, you know, it's 2010 and the strategic plan was developed really in 2007, early 2008, and the world has changed. There was great concern at that time that there, there might not really be enough bodies to do the work generated by the energy efficiency policies and programs. The world is, a, is different now, um, but the question still is relevant. The simple question was, um, what are the jobs going to be, and how is our workforce uh, education and training infrastructure in the state responding to the um, needs for training? Simple question, right? We figure out a way to count the jobs, and then we figure out how many graduates there are of training programs. What's, what skills they're training for and what skills are needed. Well, it isn't quite so simple. Um, there, besides the methodological challenges, it turns out there's all sorts of barriers and uh, issues about connecting workers to jobs and how people are hired and what kinds of jobs are created. It's really kind of as simple a question as, well, if energy efficiency pays, then why isn't everybody doing it? Um, and we know that how complicated that question is. Um, so as we approached this issue, we were really uh, trying to get an overview of all the workforce issues that might impede or get in the way of us achieving our energy savings goals in the state. Um, and you'll hear about this this morning. But we were also asked, how best uh, can we be inclusive of low-income, minority, and disadvantaged workers to make sure they have opportunities to go for the good green jobs? And we were asked, how best the CPUC and the utilities can collaborate with the larger workforce education and training community, including all levels of the educational system, um, and of course, that community is mission in life is not to save energy. Uh, it's really to uh, they think about success in terms of good jobs and careers for workers and students and job seekers. Um, so we were also essentially asked to look at the workforce outcomes of our energy policies. Now, just in closing, I, I want to say we're really bringing in. Uh, in this audience, there's really a wonderful 
mix of people. And I just wanted to actually call out um, the different groups. Who's here from the utilities? Raise your hand. Good response. Good response from the utilities, thank you. Who's here from state government energy agencies? I'm including the CPUC, the CEC, the Air Resources Board, the legislature. Um, who's here from the Workforce Investment Board, the various WIBs, the, woof, okay. Who is here from organized labor? Oh, they're always so noisy. Um, who's here from low-income advocacy groups? You guys aren't as noisy. Who's here from environmental advocacy groups? Who's here from the community colleges in the four years? Um, who have I forgotten? I know I've forgotten. K-12 education, thank you. I know I've forgotten somebody. Local government. Okay. I said the four years, and the labs. I, low income advocacy, community based organizations. And faith based organizations. Thank you, thank you. Oh, okay, great. Employers, how could I forget employers? And, and energy consulting companies that Im implement energy policy. Okay, okay, good. So, you know, I do think of, of the, the energy folks as one community and the workforce folks as another community. And, and as we went around the state, we did notice that there aren't a whole lot of people really deeply grounded in both. And so I hope part of this day is also making those bridges, people understanding each other's issues and interests and deepening all of our understanding across those lines. And so before I, I move on to introduce our speakers, I want to remember Don Weil, who our center is named after. And he was president of the Public Utilities Commission. And he had previously been research director, policy director for the California Labor Federation and a chair of our own uh, UC Berkeley Center for Labor Research and Education, where I work. And he was really one of those statesmen who could hold the environmental goals and the goals of prosperity for California workers in his two hands and really work towards pragmatic solutions and meeting the two goals. So with that, I want to turn it over first to our uh, Commissioner Diane Grunick, who it's been my great pleasure to get to know and work with over this year. She's really the champion and the, the lead at the California Public Utilities uh, Commission for energy efficiency work and led the process of the long-term uh, energy efficiency strategic plan and has been a champion of workforce issues as well. So let me turn it over to Commissioner Grunick. I'm not going to say all my thank yous now, but I really, really need to call out Tori Griffith. Where are you, Tori? <laughs> Tori! There she is in the back, making a grand entrance. She really pulled this conference together, and we really, really owe her uh, gratitude. Thanks. OK, <laughs> just so we can get it. I'll introduce her, I guess. Well, good morning to everyone. Um, I thank you very much for coming. I'm actually not quite my um, normal exuberant self, and I can see Kathy Fogel in the audience laughing because there's probably a hope that I'm not my normal exuberant self. But um, I actually have a very good reason that I was in Washington, D.C. yesterday at the 30th anniversary celebration of the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, uh, known as ACEEE. And it's one of the really premier national, international uh, advocacy groups for energy efficiency and has worked steadfastly on behalf of energy efficiency advocates for many, many years. And in fact, um, Jean Rodriguez from Southern California Edison sits on the board. 
And I was there with former CEC Commissioner Art Rosenfeld, and we were accepting um, one of the 30th anniversary awards on behalf of not just the Public Utilities Commission and not just the California Energy Commission, but in fact the whole state of California for the state's premier efforts in energy efficiency over the last 30 years. So I want to thank all of you who have been involved in this effort and extend a great big welcome to the folks who are new to energy or new to energy efficiency. Um, as Carol said, we're trying to bridge those worlds today. And I just have to say, it's a lot of fun being in this area. It's a lot of fun doing energy efficiency. It's hard, but you get the kudos of this is what provides jobs, saves energy, and saves the environment. So I'll now move on to my, re my uh, prepared remarks, but I wanted to just start off with really um, letting you know how important our work is nationally and indeed internationally. This is something that everybody watches and sees that we set the standard for where we need to move ahead. So what um, I also, before I started, wanted to recognize we have another person here in the audience, um, formerly Assembly Member Ira Ruskin here, to make sure we thank him for coming here today and the leadership that he's provided in many areas. And I think we noted we have another commissioner, Nancy Ryan, from the um, Public Utilities Commission here today as well. And um, later we will be joined by uh, CEC Chair Karen Douglas. I don't know if she's here yet. And I think possibly also um, CEC Commissioner Barbara, ba Barbara, Bob Weisemiller. You can tell, I got at home about two o'clock in the morning, so I'm you know, not quite as act articulate as might be. But Carol um, noted that we have two very distinct worlds coming together today, the workforce world and the energy world. And my role this morning is to provide backdrop to the energy side of our discussion. Today we are focused on what we call in energy the demand side, and that's energy efficiency, demand response, and distributed generation. Energy efficiency refers to the installation of technologies or tools or insulation, um, energy efficient lights that eliminate energy losses in buildings, basically. The demand response programs allow consumers and businesses to reduce the use of their electricity during the times of high energy demand when the prices for electricity are very high or where there may be a bit of scarce resources. And distributed generation is the electric power that's connected directly to the distribution grid or on the customer side of the meter. And in California, we have a very, very um, large program called the California Solar Initiative, which is trying to install the solar panels on people's homes and residences. As we know, the state of California is a leader when it comes to addressing our energy consumption. Over the past 30 years, while the rest of the United States doubled its energy consumption per person, California's consumption has remained flat. Since 1978, California's building and appliance standards have saved consumers more than 56 billion, 56 billion in electricity and natural gas costs and averted building 15 large power plants. That's why we on the energy side are so excited about energy efficiency. It's not just some side little measure. It is what has been driving the economy in California and helping protect our environment in major, major ways. Throughout these years, the California Public Utilities Commission has created a framework in which the utilities and others have developed and expanded energy efficiency programs on behalf of their customers. In May 2003, the California Public Utilities Commission, the California Energy Commission, and the Consumer Power and Conservation Financing Authority developed the first Energy Action Plan for California. And this provided a blueprint for implementing a unified policy in the state. The guiding principle of the Energy Action Plan for California is to achieve adequate, affordable, technologically advanced, and environmentally sound energy supplies. As stated in the Energy Action Plan and then reiterated in the update that was done in 2005, cost-effective energy efficiency is the resource of first choice for meeting California's energy needs. This is something we call the loading order, where we put right at the top 
energy efficiency and demand response. And in fact, this is something that is really catching on nationally, that we need to be focusing steadfastly on efficiency. So I'm going to make that the focus of my remarks this morning. Three years ago, the California Energy Commission recognized that California's ambitious energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction goals required long-term strategic planning. We also recognized the need to refocus ratepayer-funded efficiency programs on achieving long-term savings through tangible changes in the way that Californians use energy. From November 2007 through January 2008, more than 500 stakeholders participated in more than 40 workshops to focus on four end-use market sectors, the residential sector including low income, commercial, agriculture, and industry. We also looked at what we called seven cross-cutting areas, and these were heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, known in our world as HVAC, local governments, marketing, education and outreach, research and technology, codes and standards, demand side management, and lastly, but certainly not leastly, workforce education and training, the reason we are here today. Following the workshops, several drafts from the utilities, and a great deal of effort from our staff, and I want to call out again Kathy Fogel, who led this effort, um, the Commission approved the California Long-Term Energy Efficiency Strategic Plan in September 2008. The plan provides a roadmap through the year 2020 and beyond for a dramatic scaling up of statewide energy efficiency efforts designed to meet California's clean energy challenges and goals. The objective of the plan is to compel sustained market transformation. And this is the term that we use increasingly when we talk about energy efficiency, is we are trying to transform the market towards long-term deep energy savings. The plan targets chapter by chapter the areas that I just mentioned, and each sector has a profile, a vision, and strategies that are needed. But very importantly, we recognize that the success of the plan is not possible without full stakeholder input and involvement, especially because many of the people who are key to making the plan successful simply aren't subject to the jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Commission. And so in the plan, we all try to detail the necessary partnerships that have to develop. There are also, in addition to the very specific strategies in the plan, four cross-cutting goals, which we call the big, bold energy efficiency strategies for California. And I'm going to take just a moment to note them, because they're also part of what's driving our huge efforts in efficiency in the state. The first one is that all new homes in California that are built by 2020 will be what we call zero net energy buildings. In other words, large, large amounts of energy efficiency. If you build a building smart from the beginning, it sure saves costs in going back in time and making it efficient. And then once you've reduced the energy use as much as possible, you do look to provide renewable generation, solar PV, the like. That's the home. On the commercial side, we have a goal of zero net energy by 2030. And this is in correspondence with a lot of international efforts in the commercial building. Then we have one on HVAC to dramatically reshape and reform the HVAC industry in California. And again, last but certainly not least, and something that's dear to my heart, because I am also the lead commissioner on the low income energy issues, is that by 2020, every customer of at least the investor-owned utilities in California that want to participate in our low-income energy efficiency programs and are eligible shall have the benefit of doing so. So in other words, by 2020, we have full participation on our low-income energy efficiency programs. Clearly, these are ambitious goals, and this is why we've said that a key part of this is to thinking about the training component and why we have a specific chapter in the goal. So we directed our utilities to include a component of this in the plan, and we also directed the utilities to expand their ongoing efforts. Early on, we concluded that we had to quickly increase our statewide efforts to train people at all levels to plan, administer, and deliver energy efficiency measures. 
So let me take a moment to just go through in the plan it said, here's the vision that's laid out in the plan for workforce education and training. By 2020, California's workforce is trained and fully engaged to provide the human capital necessary to achieve California's economic efficiency, economic energy efficiency and demand side management potential. To do this, we laid out two specific goals. The first was to establish energy efficiency education and training at all levels of California's educational system. And the second was to ensure that minority, low income, and disadvantaged communities fully participate in training and education programs at all levels of the energy efficiency and demand side management industry. And the strategic plan notes that in order to achieve these two goals, we must develop new types of jobs that do not exist today and supplemental training for new positions. Further, we reiterated a prior conclusion of the commission that workforce development and training demands a statewide coordinated effort that integrates energy efficiency training into a wide range of public and private programs. Such coordination requires the participation of many stakeholders, including many of you gathered here today. While they are a very important player, the utilities are not the only ones who we need to effectuate the level of change for the comprehensive workforce and energy training we need in California. Nor, quite frankly, can ratepayers fund this entire effort. Thus, all of us together in this room must come together to achieve the vision of the plan. The plan also recognized that a first step in, in reaching these goals was to do a comprehensive needs assessment that looked at what are the resources that are being used for training in California today and what do we need to move forward. So let me conclude by saying that's where we are today. We've got a plan, we've undertaken the first step of doing the needs assessment, we've brought together the stakeholders. This is where all of you become critical. Having the discussions that we're going to be having today, to be sharing your experiences, sharing your ideas, to be providing comments on the plan. It's simply a draft needs assessment, draft recommendations. We need to get everybody's input. Then the commission itself, after issuance of the final report, because this is an independent report that we ask be done, not controlled by the commission, not controlled by the utilities, but giving us independent advice, the commission itself then will hold a public workshop to discuss potential changes to the utility workforce education and training programs as a result of the report. So I want to just say our key for how we have approached the plan and how we have approached this effort is that it is stakeholder driven. And I thank you all for coming here today. Your future engagement is going to be critical. Let me close with two items. First, among the people that I want to make sure we recognize, in addition to everybody you've noted, is standing in the back is my advisor, Kelly Himes, who has worked steadfastly um, in all of these areas, not just workforce training, but low income. And I thank you. And I also want to thank the utilities in particular. We had Carlos Hernandez from Southern California Edison and Robin Walther, the project ma manager consultant to Edison, and then also um, Lisa Paulo from the PUC's Energy Division. And I don't think she's here with us today because she has moved on to um, a, a different job, but Kiari Bolding, who had been with the commission, um, and what helped us dramatically in pulling this together. The very last item that I want to note is you were given a copy of um, a one-pager that had the mysterious name Engage 380, Engage 360 on top. <laughs> And it'd be very hard to do 380. So three, engage 360. Um, this is a web portal that we have just launched as a brand new um, marketing education outreach effort in California. 
where we are trying to really engage people. So it's not just p coming at you and it feels one way, but much more interactive. So we have set up a web portal. Everybody can go on and sign up and then it basically exchange your information, exchange lessons learned in the realm of energy efficiency. So this has information on how you can do it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I almost forgot. I, I'm very, very pleased to introduce Senator Lonnie Hancock. Um, I hope all of you know what a champion she has been in the legislature, first in the, well, I guess first mayor, assembly woman, and now uh, in the Senate. And I'm also very pleased that she is my local senator as well. Thanks. Thank you, Diana, and good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's really an honor to be here with you today. I, I think what we're talking about is really the three great challenges of our time, the triple challenge, if you will. Uh, jobs, meeting our energy security needs and turning around global warming, and preparing the workforce that will make it real. And we need to do all that in a time of economic crisis in our nation and here in California. The debate, friends, in the next few months is going to be about public investment or not. It's going to be about whether we must impose austerity on our people as though we were a developing country caught in the tentacles of the World Bank or the IMF, or whether there is a way to invest our way out of this with a more Keynesian model solution, or what mix of those things um, will happen. You may know that although we were successful in passing a majority vote for the state budget, that means that we can now allocate with a majority vote the money that is available. With the passage of Proposition 26, which makes state and local fees subject to a two-thirds um, vote in the legislature along with taxes, we may have a situation where no new money um, will be available to the state to meet um, the fact that our general fund has been cut from $118 billion a year to $81 billion a year. Um, and another $25 billion or so needs to be cut in the next few months. Um, we are going to be playing out our solutions in that context. And, uh, the issue for us, looking at energy efficiency, jobs, green jobs, building the green economy, is is there a triple bottom line solution to our problems? A bottom line solution that includes social justice, environmental balance, and economic viability. And that is what you're here today to talk about. And Given the mix of people in this room, you are the people who can craft a solution and who need to do that and then speak out loudly and publicly early and often because the next few months are going to be a critical time of, I think, the people of California thinking about that boring subject, the economy and budgets, in a very, very um, real way. So can we grow the green economy in California in these times? And I have to say, having looked at the report uh, briefly last night, I think it's a great report. I think the key is going to be to find implementation strategies for it and to identify what incentives may be needed and what barriers there may be to implementing it. And who can remove them? Is it local government? Is there state legislation that's needed? Is, can advocacy groups work just a little bit harder? I know you guys are all out there changing the world every day. Um, 
what do we, what do we need to do and who needs to do it? Um, right now, the green economy is about 3%, they're saying, of the jobs. And I know that there's great concern that we've overpromised on the green economy, that we need to do the things that will ensure when the workforce is there, the jobs are also there. Uh, but I do believe that the green economy will create jobs. Um, we have just begun, everybody, to do the invention, the production, the marketing for the next generation of green technology. I mean, everything from thin solar film to cool paint to permeable pavement, all is just kind of developing online. And of course, the goal of maximum energy efficiency in every building in California is an absolute key. It is the low-hanging fruit. It involves bringing to scale what we know and are able to do right now, but really bringing it to scale, and it will probably require public investment. Probably. Be <laughs> probably. <laughs> if anybody can think of a way to get every, uh, every home and commercial building uh, energy efficient by 2020 or whatever, without public investment, let me know. <laughs> we'll wave our magic wand to make it happen, <laughs> right? But it will. And it will need mandates, and it will need incentives. So to my mind, these are not untargeted tax cuts, but very careful work, really looking at the barriers that need to be removed and how we could target financial incentives and other incentives so that jobs are the result. Um, I was, I, just really quickly, there are some things that we're working on in the East Bay, including um, a program that was just adopted by the citizens of Berkeley to streamline permitting for green buildings. The PACE program, which some of you may know, which is essentially property tax financing for solar installations requiring maximum energy efficiency in every building that qualifies because, as they say, you don't want to put solar panels on a sieve. And um, regional partnerships. Uh, we have something called the East Bay uh, Green Corridor, which has already been successful in moving green businesses uh, that may outgrow their space in one city, not to China, not to Nevada, but to one of the cities on the corridor. It goes right now from San Leandro up through Richmond um, with the cities. So there are things we can do there. Education is going to be very, very important. Many of you know I do career technical education. I believe in it. I think it's how we turn our kids on uh, to learning and to, and to jobs. I think it's going to play a key role in this. There is legislation out there. Jack Scott and I had companion measures. Mine is incentivizes and gives money to high schools to do um, build career academies uh, linked to community colleges. Jack Scott's bill gives money to community colleges to do linking with high schools. Um, I want to really uh, just say we've also, in terms of greening the trades, um, in, in Contra Costa County, the building trades took the initiative to set up uh, what we call asset, architecture, engineering, construction, technology, I guess. Uh, basically a pre-apprenticeship academy because the folks from the trades were telling us that kids were coming out of our high schools unable to read or do math well enough to pass the apprenticeship exams or look down on working with their hands or both. And to enable to, uh, people to qualify for these good jobs that won't be offshored, um, we started an academy. Um, I also had legislation that passed a few years ago 
uh, AB 2855 that set up, originally was going to be nine pilot career academies in green technology in our public high schools linked to our community colleges. There are now over 100 of them. Um, the demand is very, very great. So I hope that we can replicate even more of them um, around the state. I, I really believe that green jobs, and I, I've seen groups like Richmond Build that have done a fabulous job um, moving forward with, with low income, oftentimes um, hard to place people in green jobs, that um, what the green economy does is it provides people not only with a job, but meaningful life work and a mission. And one of the jobs of every program has got to be to not only teach people how to do it, but why it matters and why it's important work for them. So just to conclude, um, I think our people want safe energy made in America that won't go away. They want a healthy environment for their children. They want good jobs, by which I mean stable, long-term, just like business needs stability to invest, so does labor. <laughs> and um, stable jobs, living wage, health care, pension. Um, that is what our people need. Um, and just in past decades in this state, we invested in ourselves. We built a great public education system, a great university system, bridges, waterways, roads, great public institutions. They were the basis of an economy in which we all benefited and did well. In the past uh, years, we've allowed many of those great public institutions to begin to decay. We need to turn that around, energy efficiency, jobs, the public investment to make it happen. You guys will be key. Let us know what you need from us in the legislature in terms of removing barriers and making investments. Thank you all so much. It's nice to live in the East Bay. <laughs> I would now like to introduce Cecilia Estolano from Green for All. Um, as, as Cecilia has the fanciest name I've ever seen for her job title, Chief Strategist of Local and State Initiatives. <laughs> um, Cecilia is the former CEO of the largest redevelopment agency in the country in Los Angeles and gained incredible experience about economic development during her tenure there. Um, she also now teaches at, at Bolt here at UC Berkeley, and I would like to welcome Cecilia. Thank you. <clears throat> I too am a little under the weather, but I hope um, if I can be as, as upbeat as Diane is coming in at 2.30 in the morning, I think I'll be doing okay. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. This summit is a culmination of a lot of work that really is the model of how government is supposed to work, if you think about it. What government needs to do is have a clear vision, some clear goals, come up with a plan, try to implement the plan, and then evaluate whether they're doing right, and then make some adjustments. And that's what we've seen with the leadership of the Public Utilities Commission. Clear values around not just achieving energy efficiency for environmental purposes, but understanding that the PUC actually is one of the most powerful economic development agencies in the state of California. The PUC could, could easily decide that its only interest in energy efficiency upgrades and retrofits is purely one to address climate change. But the good news is that this is an entity, and it looks like it's probably going to continue to be an entity, that shares the values of, of caring about creating good paying jobs, career pathway jobs for folks who've been cut out of the economy in the past and folks who right now are just simply out of work. So, I want to give you a few reflections on what I think it actually takes to achieve um, the goal of harnessing economic development and, 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 and environmental gains. Um, Green for All is a national environmental organization. Uh, our mission is to 
create a clean energy economy strong enough to lift people out of poverty. We have a very modest goal. We're just trying to transform the very trajectory of our economy to be more equitable and environmentally sustainable. Um, it's a modest goal, but it's very important. We are an environmental organization, but we're also a social justice organization. Our, our roots with labor are deep. Our roots in social justice communities and communities of color and low-income com communities are deep as well. And we occupy this intersection um, of, of coalition and um, groups that together can form a powerful, powerful movement to achieve some of the broader goals that we're talking about. So we've done tons of work on energy efficiency. Why is Green for All interested in energy efficiency? Because like D.B. Cooper, we go where the money is, right? The loading order that, that Commissioner Grunick talked about makes a lot of sense from an efficiency standpoint, but nationwide, about half a trillion dollars, is be, half a billion dollars is being put into um, energy efficiency upgrade programs in 35 communities across the country as a result of the Department of Energy's um, programs. And this is significant. But what we've seen is, um, a lot of these programs are having a hard time getting off the ground. Um, they're having a hard time getting off the ground because they're not sure about their goals. They don't have an effective financing mechanism. They haven't built the coalition to support whatever their vague goals are. And this is just a hard thing to do. We're standing up a new market in trying to create energy efficiency. We're trying to use public funds to jumpstart the creation of this whole new market. Energy efficiency retrofits uh, uh, existed in the past, or energy efficiency upgrades. I think it's a bad terminology, retrofits. It just makes you feel like you're wearing 1960s clothes, and, <laughs> and you know, or you're somehow uh, retarded in your development. You're a retrofit, right? So we like to say upgrades. Do you guys like that? Is that better? OK, upgrades. Um, so, so you know, we, we do a lot of this work not just because it makes sense from an environmental standpoint, but it's also where public funds are going. So here are three things that I think you really have to think about if you're doing the kind of work that we are. One is, you've got to be able to leverage the role of government. Um, we are in the worst recession in 70 years. Uh, at the end of the day, the reason we're not coming out of it so quickly is because of a lack of aggregate demand to be a total wonky economist. But it's basically not enough people make enough money to be able to buy things. And that's because we've been on a trajectory of growing income inequality for the last 30 years. Productivity has increased 60%. But the average median wage of a male worker has gone down 5%. Where'd all the money go? So this growing income inequality has made it very difficult for us to pull ourselves out of this recession because we can't just keep spending because we've already maxed out our credit cards and our home equity lines of credit, right? So that's what we're talking about. So if we want to get out of this recession, we need to be able to leverage government investment. Yes, that's radical. It's very Keynesian. <laughs> Who had the audacity to talk about Keynes in this day of, of untargeted tax cuts? Um, but, uh, but you know, we really do believe that, that at this moment in history, we need to use the buying power and the strategic investment of government at all levels of government to try to pull us out of this recession and send it on to a new trajectory that addresses income inequality as well as disparities in environmental conditions. Okay? We have to do both at the same time. So we have to leverage the roles of government I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Three really key roles, and I'm pleased to say the PUC is taking on all of these, right? One is as a regulatory body, two as an investor, and three as a convener. This, five minutes, really, Lisa? Okay, I'm going to keep rolling. Um, so this PUC has been able to take on all those three roles and leverage it towards a very clear goal of addressing environmental issues as well as social equity. The second thing that you need to do is to be able to align workforce development with an economic development strategy. California is not really known for having an economic development strategy. Do you know what it is? Because I don't, and I, and I do this for a living. So, so we, but we do have the beginnings of a good workforce development. Our, our system of community colleges and vocational schools and two and four year colleges is quite excellent. Um, but it's not aligned, it doesn't have an equal partner in the economic development framework. PUC is trying to step into this, actually. And it's quite challenging. The, the Energy Commission is trying to step into this. So if others aren't doing it, agencies need to step up, particularly agencies like the PUC that has somewhere in around $3 billion on energy efficiency to invest, right? Um, the third thing you need to do, frankly, is build a movement to support this approach. And that's why it is so interesting to see this room. I was really pleased that Carol Zabin asked, like, who's from CBOs and who's from, who are from utilities and business? It's going to take a broad-based movement that transcends an electoral cycle to keep, to keep the investments going in the right way, 
right? So we have to have labor at the table, community-based organizations, faith-based, social justice organizations, as well as the environmental community, have to see the shared interest in, in investing in energy efficiency upgrades. It is a wonky world of energy efficiency upgrades. So we have to talk each other's language. We have to try to translate across the, uh, the, the gulf. We have to talk about good paying career path jobs. We have to talk about our labor friends opening up the doors of their apprenticeship program, even in the depths of this recession, to those who face barriers to employment, who have not had the access to the tremendous power that labor brings for, for a regular working person. Um, so the good news is that those three things, we're doing them here in California, or at least we're, we've been trying to do them. We've got a PUC that understands its role as an investor, as a regulator, and as a convener, as bringing people together to try to achieve solutions. Secondly, we actually have a good track record of, of, in a few places, of trying to align an economic development strategy with a workforce strategy. And I'll just take the example of my own former agency, the Community Redevelopment Agency of Los Angeles, where we decided that whenever we invested a million dollars to support development, that those folks needed to hire 30% of the construction workers from the local community, from, from high unemployment areas. And 10% had to come from folks facing barriers to employment. And we worked with 13 pre-apprenticeship programs to create the pipeline that aligned these folks, got them ready to enter apprenticeship programs, and got them on the jobs to help build the downtown, help build Hollywood, help revitalize many of our communities. Okay, so we know how to do this in communities across California. We just need to do it at scale, at scale. And that's why what the PUC is doing is so powerful, and that's why this report is so important. And then the third thing that we have going for us is we actually have a track record of robust coalitions of labor, environment, social justice, low-income communities, um, progressive elements of the business community. Does this sound familiar? Because that's what defeated Prop 23. That is the coalition that defeated Prop 23. Um, yeah, you should all. We outraised two Texas oil companies two to one. We were able to mobilize not just um, the folks from clean tech in the Silicon Valley, but also folks from the social justice communities who worked in low income communities, communities of color, um, to show that we as California do not accept that we have to have dirty environment. We have to uh, sacrifice our planet for jobs. We've heard that rhetoric report before, and people understand it's just not true. So we've got what it takes. We've got, in, at least in the PUC and some of the other um, agencies, and I'm very happy about November's results. I get to say that because I'm not a government employee. Um, that you know, we, we have the potential to continue on with um, government agencies at the state level that understand that they could align their roles to support these broader goals, right? Secondly, we know how to do workforce development with economic development. We just have to be explicit about it, okay, and get to scale. And then third, we should be really explicit about trying to keep those coalitions together that reflect the best of California, reflect its diversity, reflect its progressive values, reflect the value that Californians share that is really quite moving about the importance of a good quality environment. So in closing, um, let me just tell you, I just came from Australia on a study visit about workforce development and green jobs. And um, somebody who advises the city of Sydney on sustainability said to me, what is it about California? Why, is your, why are you more energy efficient than the whole rest of the country? Why is it that you guys care about this stuff more than anybody else? What is it so special about California that you defeated this Texas thing, this Texas oil company thing? Why did you do it? And I said, you know what? We are the left coast, that's true, but because it's a naturally beautiful state. It's a place that people come for opportunity. So they have a naturally optimistic view that they can solve problems. And though we may have not been investing in the public education and infrastructure the way we should have, what I see what happened in the Prop 23 election is that you have that coalition of optimism, not willing to accept of fear as the driver of policy. So let's enjoy the day and let's hear about uh, the CPUC's findings. Thank you. Before we start, I also want to recognize that we do have another commissioner here up in the balcony, um, Commissioner Bob Weisenmiller from the California Energy Commission. Welcome, Bob. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> my name is Lee 
Lisa Hoyos, and I work with the uh, Labor Center and also the Apollo Alliance, and I'm just here to transition between panels. We had an outstanding panel to kick us off, and thanks again to all of you. We're doing two things immediately before the next panel comes on. One is just housekeeping related. If you look at your agenda, I just want to point out that we are blitzing the first three hours of today. There's a lot of information. We do not have a formal break before noon. So if you'd like to get a, grab an extra cup of tea or use the restroom, which is down the hall, please do so as you personally need to. And um, the next thing I want to do, and so I hope too many folks don't get up right now, is a bit of a participatory exercise. There's been so many studies that indicate that if you know what you want to get out of something, you'll get that out of it. You're more likely to. So we have a participatory five-minute exercise. We're asking you to do the following. Sit, um, we're asking you to think about two things you want to get out of the day, be they research and understanding related, be they network related, two goals you have between now and the end of our reception tonight at 6.30. And what we'd like you to do is uh, just find your own little working group with your neighbor. And if there's an odd person out, uh, include them. So we'll either have groups of two or groups of three, preferably two, but like a, fit into a, a, a group if you're an odd person out and just share the two things that you want to get out of today and then listen to your partner share the two things they're hoping to get out of the day. So it'll get a little loud in here, but huddle close. We'll do that for five minutes and transition then into the next panel. Thank you. We're going to now ask Carol Zabin to introduce the next panel. If folks could uh, focus up here again. Thank you. <laughs> I only use that when I really need to. So uh, Carol will be bringing us into the next session, but I must note it's great when people have this much to talk about. So clearly you have more than five minutes to share with even the random person sitting next to you. So we have lunch time and of course the reception. We hope everyone will stay through the you know, closing of the full day. And Carol Zabin. Thanks, Lisa. So now we're gonna um, be presenting our uh, research results and our uh, preliminary recommendations. And so um, just to let you know how it's going to go down, um, we're going to have five presenters, um, including myself at the end, and we'll go through all of them and we'll take questions at the end. I, this might be a little slog, it's, it's a lot of information, um, but we really feel like it's important to get it out on the table um, to inform the discussions later. So bear with us as we go through this. And um, it's, a really, it's been a really fascinating process. And I want to thank, I inter we interviewed in person or by phone many of you and want to thank you for your great wisdom and your perspectives. So. Um, what we're going to do uh, is I'm going to introduce everybody now, and then we'll just go down the chain. Um, talking about the economic context and our job projections and training needs will be Karen Chapel, professor of city and uh, regional planning at UC Berkeley, and a um, couple decades experience uh, in research on workforce and economic development. Um, then we'll turn to our description of our training and education infrastructure in the state. And we have to go through all of this very briefly. So you'll see yourselves here in about two seconds. Um, but there's more detail in the report. And we'll have first Elaine Geertner, who's head of the uh, Centers for Excellence in our community college system and heads up the regional, um, the network of Centers for Excellence and head, headed up our team of also John Carees from San Francisco City College and Genia Lindstrom from San Bernardino. Um, then we will turn, uh, I'll pass it to Jane Peters, our partner from Research into Action, an energy consulting firm. 
and she'll talk about some of the some of the workforce development infrastructure. We'll turn it over to Jesse Halpern Finnerty, who's on our Labor Center staff, and then I'll round out the research. So with that, I'll introduce Karen. Okay, uh, thank you, Carol, for that introduction. Um, I'm Karen Chapel from uh, City and Regional Planning, and I have the unenviable task of presenting the year-long work of 10 people, not just me, 10 people, including four professors, four grad students, and our fearless task mistresses, Carol Zabin and Robin Walter, um, who continually raised the bar for all of us while hurting um, us cats. So um, I, what I'm going to do is present first Michael Reichs and Lynn Scholl's work, um, which, which discusses uh, how we should be thinking about green jobs in the context of California and the US's jobless recovery. And um, uh, they make five points. And I'm going to cover them briefly, give you a little preview of them, and then uh, show you four quick pictures. Uh, to describe them. So first, we're going to look at what, what exactly is this recession, the Great Recession. Then we're going to look at who's the most impacted, what sectors are the most impacted. Um, we'll be looking also at the uh, uh, persistence of unemployment in the state and what the projections tell us. Um, then we'll be looking at the role of, of wage inequality um, and what that means for middle wage jobs. And then we're going to uh, just really raise a question about middle skilled jobs. Um, what, what are the green jobs? How middle skilled are they? Are they middle wage as well? And that's a question that's going to come out uh, actually throughout the next hour in the other presentations as well. So here we are in uh, comparing the last three recessions. This is a work by Dr. Silvia Allegretto of the institute uh, where we work. Um, so this is uh, the blue line is the 1990 recession. Um, the 2001 recession is in red, and the 2007 to 9. Uh, recession is in black on the bottom. Notice that there is a big difference between this recession and the previous recessions in that we have not been able to climb back out of it. By this point, we should be climbing out of it. We're 30 months into it. We're, we're not. We're stuck at the bottom. Um, looking at specific sectors and job loss in California, according to the EDD, uh, we've uh, the, the hardest hit sector, not surprisingly to those of you in the audience, um, is construction uh, with about 40% uh, uh, job loss in the last three years. Uh, manufacturing um, and professional services are also hard hit. That's really important uh, for green jobs because a lot of them are in those sectors. If we think about what's going to happen in the future, um, we can project out unemployment. And uh, again, you always have to take projections with a grain of salt. Uh, but here is what the EDD tells us is going to happen. Uh, we uh, are likely to get down to an 8% unemployment rate by 2015. Now, actually, my colleagues, Michael Reich and uh, Sylvia Allegretto, think this might be a little bit optimistic. They believe we're going to get to an 8% unemployment rate by 2020. Um, so that, uh, we, we, in our analysis, we take that into account. It's really important to think about wage inequality in this state and how that might impact us. There are many economists that suggest that greater wage inequality is one of the reasons it's making, us, making it harder for us to come out of this um, recession. So here we have California in purple versus the US in uh, yellow. California uh, has uh, seen greater decline in wages for the bottom, the 20th percentile, a greater increase in wages for the 80th percentile. So everything you hear about inequality in the country is magnified in this state. Um, and so now we're ready to move on uh, to some projections, given that context. Um, so what we're going to do in the remaining uh, eight minutes or whatever I have is, uh, is discuss what the job creation is going to be in energy efficiency, distributed generation, and demand response. I'm just going to call that energy efficiency from now on. Um, and then we're going to look at what the supply of unemployed workers is in these sectors. And uh, then we're going to talk about what that means for training. 
So we had a seven-step um, methodology. This was an uh, intensely uh, research-based methodology. We did some modeling, but really we, we relied on empirical uh, research. We looked at what, uh, what we knew, what budgets and so forth told us about where investments were going. So the first thing we did was identify the policies and programs, uh, both public and, and uh, policy-driven uh, pri private investment. Um, and then we looked at the dollars that were uh, being spent in these programs and that are projected to be spent for 2010, 2015, and 2020. We created three scenarios, uh, low, medium, and high. I'll be talking about the medium for the rest of the six minutes. Um, and then we translated this into industries. Uh, we used a, 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 a computable general equilibrium model to look at the total job impact in the state. We narrowed it down to direct jobs. Um, that would be relevant for uh, workforce development. Um, we, um, we looked at what occupations that would be in, and then we allocated them to regions. And uh, this is a quick overview. We can talk about it more in uh, the discussion, but I, uh, I'll be describing this in more detail right now. So there are several important assumptions that we made that you should be aware of. Uh, first of all, we're only looking at one subsector of the green economy. So we're not looking at sectors like transportation. We're not looking at uh, utility side generation. We're not looking at recycling. We're not looking at environmental re remediation. So and that's the, the types of sectors that a lot of the green economy studies have looked at. So we're a little bit narrower. Uh, we, so we need to emphasize that because our, our numbers are a little no, lower than some of the other studies. Um, we're only looking at policy-driven private investment. So there are lots of types of private investment in energy efficiency that might be occurring. We found that we really couldn't uh, empirically describe that investment. We don't really know how markets are going to be transformed. We don't really know what are the technological changes that are going to happen in PV panels. Um, so uh, we wanted to be very careful. We didn't want to make uh, big assumptions about technological changes. So we're, we're not looking at, at, at the many different types of private investment that could occur in the future. Um, we're uh, also we're, um, um, thinking very carefully about these jobs and uh, what they're going to mean for workforce development. So there are a number of different jobs generated by energy efficiency investment. Um, not all of them are going to work in energy efficiency. Some of them are going to be administrative jobs. Um, and some of these jobs are not going to need training. Um, so what we do is we differentiate between the direct jobs, the ones that are directly getting the energy efficiency investment, and the indirect and induced jobs. And I'll give you some examples of that in a second. Um, we also differentiate uh, among uh, occupations. So we look uh, at, at the industries that are funded by investments, and we look at the hundreds of different occupations in each industry, and we only uh, focus on the ones that will need, actually need training. Another really important distinction that we make in our study is that we look at job person years. So you will hear many people, mostly politicians, throwing numbers of jobs around, jobs created. That is, uh, it can be a misnomer. Uh, it's not very carefully considered because very often jobs created don't last very long. A construction job might last two months. Um, a, a, a job could last one year. So what we do is we take job person years. So all of our numbers are in job person years. This is investment that funds one job for one year, one person in one, uh, working one job for, for one year. Um, that actually, what we we then find is that that because in energy efficiency people are not working full time in uh, on energy efficiency tasks, but only part of their job on energy efficiency tasks. What we say is that these job person years can then be divided among multiple workers. Um, so the, there are actually more workers that need training because many different workers are doing uh, spending part of their time on energy efficiency tasks. OK, so let's get to the punchline. So here's what's going on in terms of investment. Here are the dollars that are going in from 2010 to 2015 to 2020. Uh, 2010, we started about $6.6 .6 billion of, of public investment and policy-driven private investment. We go up to 2020. Uh, we have $11.2 billion, and a uh, notice that the orange and the purple dominate, that's ratepayer funding, and that's leveraged private investment. The, the uh, federal piece declines, obviously, after ERA uh, expires, um, and the state piece is actually quite small. 
Then looking at specific program areas, uh, we wanted to give you an ex uh, a sense of what are the most important areas. Um, uh, the IOU and POU, energy efficiency programs, are the biggest program area in terms of expenditures, so the, uh, uh, the followed by demand response and smart meters, um, and then the Title 24 and the California Solar Initiative. Now here we're differentiating in the darker green uh, between the uh, public investment and the uh, lighter green between the, the participant costs, the leveraged private investment. And uh, so you'll see that certain things are, are solely driven by private investment, like the Title 24, the compliance with building codes. Um, the IOU programs have both public and private investments. Um, other other um, programs are only uh, public investment. So we look at both. Okay, so what are the job creation impacts of all this uh, money? So from, from here on, we're, we're looking at medium scenario and uh, uh, we're looking at uh, the specific uh, job creation impacts of all these uh, public and private investments. So uh, this is to give you a, a sort of overview of, of how we conceptualize this. Um, we start with the total job person years, and this is total including direct, indirect, and induced. Um, that's 211,500 in 2020. Um, we uh, then net out of that the direct job person years, the most relevant uh, ones for the workforce development purposes, which is 39,000. We go down from there to the 2020 direct job, person years, subtracting out all the other previous years. So again, we, when you're thinking about training, it's the, pe the, the people that need to get trained in that particular year. Even though we had 30, we have 39,000 uh, jobs generated in that year, uh, most of those people will have been trained in previous years because they will have absorbed the job person years um, in, the, in the other parts of the decade. Um, so we, we reduce our, our numbers here from about 39,000 to 3,300 jobs in 2020. Um, and then if you translate that in, into the occupations that actually need uh, training, the numbers get even smaller. We're down to 2,300 jobs. So, um, so here, uh, just to uh, look at how we expand that back out, uh, then we take those uh, jobs that need training, we expand them out to workers uh, based on, uh, because only part of the job is dedicated to energy efficiency, so the worker number is a little bigger. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about incumbent workers. So total job creation was, uh, uh, again, 211,000. Direct jobs are about a quarter of those jobs. The direct jobs are those mostly in construction, also management and uh, engineering. Uh, the indirect jobs are uh, in manufacturing, supplying services and, and uh, goods to the direct uh, employers. And the induced jobs are mostly in grocery stores and apparel. And so the 75% this, this here you see is, is, is those types of jobs generated based on household consumption. Um, so here we, ha we go uh, next from the, uh, if we're looking at how we get to the uh, uh, direct job person years, uh, what, how it changes over time, we get to 39,000 total jobs in 2020. Um, we're expanding considerably. Um, right now the baseline uh, year in 2009 is 13,000 jobs. So the number of jobs is expanding considerably, uh, uh, mostly due to the IOU and uh, private investment. Um, if we're looking then at how we get to the, the uh, job person years by occupation, we're narrowing down here uh, then just to uh, the, the occupations that are within these uh, sectors. Uh, you can see, this is an example, the distribution in 2020. Um, again, the construction trades are dominating here. Uh, about two thirds of the jobs are in construction. Uh, and then we go from the, uh, the net new person years uh, to the actual workers needing training. Um, that, again, expands the number again. So in terms of occupations, uh, we have about uh, over 5,000 uh, workers in, in the 2020 alone that will need training, again, uh, mostly in construction, but also in admin and management. So how does that compare to labor supply? What we looked at was two unemployment scenarios, and I just highlighted here an example here. Uh, in the state, uh, in, uh, in 2020, we project that in the building envelope 
construction trades, we will have about uh, 48,000 unemployed workers in 2020. Uh, that compares to, in that one year, 2020, uh, the, about 2,000 workers needing training. Um, so based on uh, the investment provided by energy efficiency programs. Uh, so we have a, a huge surplus of unemployed workers that are not going to be absorbed by the investment that we have at current levels. And just to play out an example, uh, we'll, we took electricians in Los Angeles County. Um, in 2009, uh, we have about 2,000 unemployed electricians in Los Angeles County alone. In 2020, uh, on the low scenario, we project this is going to go down to, um, to 820 unemployed electricians. We project, in terms of job person years, we project 71 new electrician jobs in that year alone, um, funded by this investment. Um, and that gets expanded in terms of workers needed training, gets expanded to 123 uh, uh, workers' jobs. So uh, the surplus in LA County for electricians is 820 unemployed. Uh, minus uh, 123, that should say, excuse me, um, uh, um, uh, unemployed, it, it comes to, I uh, see my math is off here. <laughs> <coughs> That's really embarrassing. Um, so somewhere around 700 unemployed electricians. So, uh, so we have a huge surplus um, uh, of, of uh, an inability to absorb our uh, unemployment. So uh, that leaves us with the question of who do we need to train for. Um, we have um, actually uh, thought about this quite a bit and uh, realized that, that a lot of the energy efficiency training is actually going to have to go to the incumbent workers um, and uh, that are uh, working in uh, working in their uh, energy efficiency related jobs, maybe not directly funded by this money, but occasionally doing energy efficiency tasks. And so this chart shows, gives a perspective. It shows what those um, incumbent and uh, new workers are. Those are the ones in, in blue by 2020. Um, we'll have uh, quite a few, a large workforce in these uh, top occupations. Um, those are the ones that are going to need the bulk of the training um, compared to the, the jobs generated. So some recommendations. First of all, we need to focus on training for incumbent workers, clearly. Um, secondly, we really need to think about job creation. These numbers should be a call for us to think much more strategically about how we target our energy efficiency inv uh, investment to create jobs. And we should be doing that in a number of different ways. First of all, we need to be strategic about what programs we target. We need to target the ones that yield more jobs per investment dollar. Um, secondly, we need to re recapture manufacturing jobs in California. This study found that three quarters of the manufacturing jobs generated by this investment are going out of state, mostly out of the country. And thirdly, we need to uh, capitalize on our labor market that we have here. We have an incredible niche in this state. We have first mover advantage in energy efficiency skills. We should be building on that to, to build up our export sector and leading the rest of the country. Thank you. So, and now we'll go to Elaine from the community colleges. Good morning. <clears throat> the slide that you see right here represents our snapshot of the workforce infrastructure that we looked at during this research project. You can see that there are eight types of institutions. We look for those uh, in the areas that are relevant to energy efficiency, and I'll again, like Karen, use energy efficiency to mean demand, um, e e DG and whatever. <laughs> I'm tongue-tied. So you can see on the far left the eight types of institution that comprise this research study. We looked for them to make sure that they were relevant and they represent 
K-12 programs, higher education, community-based organizations, so the full gamut of types of institutions that would train. The criteria for the inclusion of these training programs was they trained for occupations that we found in the labor market projections that Karen shared with you, or they were programs that were self-identifying that they trained in energy efficiency and the related occupations, and so they were both traditional and specialized programs. We identified a total of 548 unique training programs um, amongst that. We did not cover everything. We didn't cover, for example, administrative occupations unless they specialized in energy efficiency, nor individual courses in colleges, nor grant-funded initiatives unless they did um, show up within some of the institutional groups that you see here. My three-person center of excellence research team took on four of those eight institutional categories, so I'd like to talk to you about each of them very briefly. Um, we interviewed K-12 programs, and the graphic that is in front of you here actually represents what we found to be a logical sequencing of how these programs in K-12 through work. And we're able to categorize them into two buckets, so to speak, energy efficiency uh, or energy awareness programs, which included rate funder programs as well as private programs, and then the others, which were beginning in about grade six, uh, career exploration and preparation programs. Um, so this graphic shows that continuum, and we found that the different uh, players that we interviewed were following the sequence to some degree more or less, as, especially as they evolved. Um, it's important to talk about the energy awareness programs because the primary focus in those programs is really about introducing kids, primarily maybe K through five, into the whole world of energy awareness and also uh, have them take that uh, into their families and into their communities. So in addition to making them aware, I think we were also looking about changing some norms around energy efficiency in these programs and energy consumption. When we get into the career preparation and exploration programs, a very important player um, is the California um, uh, Career Academies. And of all the career academies, there are 424. We found 39 that were looking at green occupations. And um, just a bit about career academies, they are focusing on underperforming students with an eye to not only giving them these career exploration and preparation components, but also retaining them in high school and having them go on to other areas of education. The second area that we explored were the regional occupation centers and programs, again, primarily nested in high schools and publicly funded programs. So we wanted to look at how they prepare students for entry-level jobs and occupational tracks. And you can see in this graphic, you can see the occupational tracks that, they are, um, that, that we looked at. Um, 59 of the 74 ROCPs are looking at 210 different programs in these career tracks. About 90% are integrating green skills, and only about 10% are really making green skills the core topic of in instruction. Community-based organizations. You can see here that, again, we looked at traditional trades and emerging occupations, and the emerging occupations are primarily in the three areas that you see here. You can see that there are um, many more um, average statewide graduates, but when we look at the number of hires, you can see that this is uh, quite low, less than half percent of the completers into programs. And we didn't really, we aren't really able to exactly say how, why. It could be the economy, it could be um, the graduation rates in, in emerging occupations uh, just are an imbalance in the labor supply. It could be uh, a number of things, but we, we think it's worth more exploring, but we couldn't make a conclusion there. Now let's get to where we know the, what we know the best, the community colleges. Um, we identified 440 programs um, in energy efficiency in both tr traditional and emerging occupations that you see here, and 41 programs that had a part of an apprenticeship component. Um, if you look at the awards in the, uh, in the 98% or in traditional occupational tracks, the highest being construction, the lower number of awards in emerging occupations, again, um, is probably largely due to the fact that these programs are pretty new, usually less than two years, and some of the short-term training programs um, require industry certifications, so we may not see a, cert a community college certification. It's also worth noting that the community colleges responded that Latinos account for about 50% of program 
participants. So that's particularly important um, as we look at them as a, as a key for minorities. One last slide, community college pathways. Here are uh, the various places in the community colleges that uh, are critical. Um, we have uh, the pre-employment programs, which include apprenticeship, but a lot of the, the organizations that we interviewed, community college programs, noted that many of their participants were people that were, for example, just going back to take a course in, in code changes or changing regulations. So they weren't necessarily captured in completers or graduates, but rather they were there for upgrade training and they were already working professionals. Data that we didn't completely capture but is really worth talking about are contract training and workforce training for clients. And that would include, for example, a program like the Power Pathways program that you all may be um, doing. That they are uh, the purpose of retaining workers or upskilling workers that are already at work. Uh, sometimes it's displaced workers. We've contracted through workforce investment boards for that kind of a population. Typically, that's a, a program that does not uh, get state apportionment, so they are paid for through funds. They are much more flexible. They may start and end in a different way. The content will be more tailored to the performance requirements of an employer, for example. And actually, we think that about 40,000 additional students are served, so it's an important um, area not to miss. Um, the other one, one last thing before we close is the community colleges are serving roughly right now about 200,000 students and the recent budget that we, we resolved got some funding enough for about 60,000 students but we are turning away a lot of potential students and this mid-year's budget cut may make that worse. So I just want to underscore how critical community colleges are and we hope that we will be able to make an impact despite these kinds of constraints. Thank you, and now I would like to introduce Jane Peters from Research Into Action. Okay, I have three more sets of the uh, sectors briefly. Uh, colleges and universities, uh, we focused on the relevant departments for these key occupations. So engineering, architecture, and construction management are the most significant. In addition, there's a small number of multidisciplinary energy programs in California, such as the ERG here at UC Berkeley. These offer specialized courses, seminars, certificates, or degrees, and they specialize in efficiency, distributed generation, and demand response uh, training for policy and planners. There's a, been a limited focus on energy systems in civil engineering and construction management. Mechanical engineering, on the other hand, has been more engaged with energy systems, but not on a real large scale. Only in architecture do we really see a pretty strong emphasis on energy systems training in the curriculum. We also looked at private organizations. These are the vocational colleges, trade associations, worker training organizations such as Clean Edison or Boots on the Roof. These organizations typically provide either entry level or incumbent worker training, usually short term courses, fee based, and some use public funds. We identified about 55 organizations. Some have a lot more than 10 locations, so there's well more, well more than 100 locations of these types of organizations. There's also national organizations that accredit the programs and certificates that some, that some of these organizations offer. Um, some specialties still don't have certification like Small Wind. Other specialties have competing certifications and competing accreditations. And these include auditing, green building and construction, and solar. Trade associations such as RESIS or the NATE HVAC certification efforts address incumbent workers but are only slowly incorporating energy efficiency into their curricula. Finally, the utility training centers. This is certainly not least. Uh, these investor-owned utilities have two primary avenues for providing training to the workforce the first through their energy centers, and there's seven in the state. In 2009, the center's courses averaged about three hours and provided training to 42,000 people, both end users, as in consumers, and workforce me members. Through the centers, the utilities have been working closely with some professional and contractor associations to develop collaborative training, but they've had less engagement with the building trades or with workforce development 
programs. Utilities also offer the programs that target schools, colleges, universities, some of what Elaine talked about. And these are primarily been focused on consumer education by training people in schools so they'll, they'll be better consumers in the future. And, and next is Jessica. Okay, um, so there's about 135 state certified apprenticeships in the building trades that are relevant to energy efficiency and distributed generation. We did about 40 interviews, and many of you are in the room today. I'm happy to see. We focused on sheet metal, electrical, plumbing, and others. There's about 5,000 um, apprentices that completed their programs or journeyed out sort of each year on average in an average year, and about 4,400 of those come from the union-affiliated programs run by joint labor management committees. Apprenticeship is the learn while you earn model. It's employment and on the job training, employment and training using both on the job and classroom instruction. Many apprenticeships uh, partner with community colleges uh, for the classroom instruction portion and some apprentices can then receive college credit. Apprentices earn a higher wage based on their skill acquisition and the end result is the mastery of the trade and portable industry recognized certifications. This includes a journey card itself as well as specialty certifications um, like Nate for sheet metal. Apprentice, um, apprenticeships are typically three to five years. And another feature is that employers sit on the committees and determine the training at the national and local levels. This links the training to labor market needs in terms of the skills taught and the number of slots available, which is then directly linked to industry demand. Training is paid for by an investment from employers and workers for each hour worked. The final point we want to make about apprenticeships in particular as an institution is that they train for both their traditional trades and they include skills for energy specific work. Energy efficiency is incorporated into the curriculum as building code changes, as manufacturer specifications change, and as contractors move into new markets such as advanced lighting. So how do all the pieces of the workforce training system fit together? This is a big question. Um, and to answer it, we mapped career and training pathways for different kinds of jobs. The three we looked at were professional or managerial jobs, commercial and public sector construction jobs, and residential or small commercial construction jobs. So this is the first. Um, and I want to point out that the numbers show the estimated annual graduates in this state. And this demonstrates the scale of each training institution in the different sectors. We also noted here the length of the programs, which gets at the issue of scope and the depth of the training. And this slide is for professional and managerial occupations that are related to energy. And the primary jobs or skill areas we identified are architecture, engineering, and construction management. Um, so you can see here that four-year colleges and universities are really the main site for this kind of training, this kind of long-term advanced training in these areas. And they graduate about 4,300 people per year with a BA or higher. Community colleges, as was mentioned, offer two-year transfer programs in these areas to help people from disadvantaged communities get into high-wage professional jobs. There are about 700 transfer graduates in these areas each year. And then skills upgrading happens at the utility energy centers and some private training programs. These are short-term, really high-volume trainings that focus on a particular skill. And they're also open typically to many occupations. So like a lead training course would be open to more than just architects, although that's the area. Okay, so the next slide shows the construction trades pathways in the commercial and public sectors. <clears throat> um, the primary occupations are the traditional building trades with energy specific training included, as listed up there. Um, some examples. Apprenticeship is the main site of long term training for these jobs with about 5,000 graduates per year. Although there's few entry requirements for apprenticeship, other than testing, there are many applicants for few slots and disadvantaged workers face barriers. Because of this, pre-apprenticeship is really critical in increasing access to apprenticeship. And we've talked about this a little bit today. And these ex programs exist in California at CBOs, community colleges, and ROPs. But there's a lot of opportunity for expansion here. Upon completion, apprenticeships offer skills upgrading for journey workers, which helps them learn to new technologies and best practices, and gives them the chance to gain skills to advance in their careers. Utility energy centers and private training programs also provide advanced skills upgrading for incumbent workers, and several thousand people per year, again, attend these short-term, really high-volume trainings um, in these areas. 
So I also want to note here, it's the bottom bar says work experience. So people don't really need a journey card to enter work in the construction trades, and some go straight into the labor market. However, there is relatively high union density in the uh, commercial and public sectors, so apprenticeship is more common and overall training standards in this sector are higher. So that's sort of a contrast to um, the residential and small commercial sectors, uh, construction trades and energy specialties pathways, which we show here. And as you can see, the sector is kind of, what we found in our interviews and sort of pulling all the pieces together is that they're lacking a long-term advanced skills training institution with the exception of a small number of residential tracks in a few apprenticeships. The training in these cases is more general and targets either entry-level general construction jobs or entry-level energy-specific jobs um, like weatherization installer technician. Uh, CBOs, ROPs, and private training programs all offer this kind of training at the, for the entry-level uh, construction or energy-specific jobs, and they train about 1,000 people per year or more, but again, these are pretty short-term. Um, community colleges also graduate about 1,000 people per year with certificates or two-year degrees in the trades, and some have started new energy programs, um, like for solar technicians, for example. And I'm going to wrap it up, hand it back to Carol. So, a lot of information to absorb. How are you guys all holding up? Okay, and you can see really the breadth of our workforce education um, and training infrastructure in the state. So I want to go back to our original question to, to sum up what we've seen so far, and then I'll add um, a few more research pieces. Um, so we reviewed our job projections and we, were, we saw the queue of unemployed workers and we got a brief overview of our state's infrastructure. So one of the biggest revelations is that the number of training slots far outweigh the number of uh, available jobs in these sectors. So that, that does mean, and I know you know this experience, that folks are graduating from training programs and not able to, to find work. So in the short run, we darn well better really justify any new training programs, because it looks like we don't need them. There is a need to focus on incumbent skills upgrade training. And in the longer run, what we found is that many of the jobs that are being created are in traditional occupations. And energy efficiency skills really need to be integrated, uh, and we need to continue to integrate them into our existing institutions that train for these main occupations. Finally, what we found is there's kind of a muddle around what skills are needed. There's swaths where it's clear, but there's big swaths where there's competing uh, certifications or lack thereof. And so the training programs don't really know what to train for. Tell me the standards. I heard from CBOs and community colleges. Tell me the standards so I know what to train for. We need a clear signal. OK. So a few more pieces of the research, and then we'll circle around to the recommendations. How can we leverage our workforce infrastructure so it's positioned well when jobs do come back? How do we open up opportunities and be inclusive of disadvantaged minority and low-income workers? And what are the deeper skill and quality issues that can affect our ability to meet our energy savings goals? So we looked at best practices in workforce development programs, and sector strategies have been shown to, as having the best track record for training, particularly for jobs that don't require a four-year degree. They're promoted by the California Workforce Investment Board, by the Green Jobs Council, and really the Obama administration is trying to shift more and more of our workforce dollars um, into this type of strategy. Sector strategies are regional partnerships of employers, educators, workforce developers, labor, and other stakeholders, usually led by a strategic intermediary who brings employers to the table and also coordinates among the various different pieces of our workforce infrastructure. These partnerships have a dual customer focus. They emphasize the needs of employers for skilled workers, as well as the needs 
of workers for good jobs, evaluating the needs so that the investments make business sense and employers will take them up. Sector strategies are also aimed at developing career training pathways, often with a series of credentials that build one another so that these stackable credentials enable people to get credit for previous work, previous training, and move up rungs of a job ladder or lattice that actually exists in the labor market. Sector strategies also have the potential to uh, address the objective of providing access to good jobs for disadvantaged workers. To address inclusion, you really need all the other pieces of the puzzle and then a lot of attention to workforce preparation for specific, uh, per specific groups of job seekers and low-income workers. Um, this is primarily done by leading or partnering with organizations that have the expertise, commitment, and relationships to support these workers and create strong pipelines. There are a lot of best practices. They're detailed in our report. There's several sessions this afternoon on pipelines. They include training on soft and technical skills, supportive learning strategies, wraparound services, careful screening and career counseling, and a host of other supports. Um, for the most part, the good programs that exist, and there are great programs in California, um, are small, and they have long waiting lists. And this is because there is just a lack of good jobs to place people in. And here we come back to our earlier theme of wage inequality and really a lot of low-wage jobs out there. So here's the rub. A lot of low-wage industries out there, and some of the ones that we need to be focused on um, for our energy savings goals are some of those industries. Residential construction is one. And it's a sector that you really don't want to place people in a lot of the residential jobs if you're trying to build pathways out of poverty. So although it's outside the traditional sphere of trainers and educators, we see a lot of the more successful programs hooking up with efforts to improve low-wage labor markets. And there's really two complementary strategies. The first is the career ladders or lattice strategies, but on the not so, in addition to working on it on the training side, we need to work on it on the job side, um, working with employers to actually structure jobs in the way in a way that there's promotion opportunities for folks as they acquire skills. This is often done through certifications. And the Department of Energy effort now to create certifications in residential retrofit falls into this category. These rigorous voluntary skill standards and certifications are for all four field jobs in residential retrofit, including the first rung on the ladder, the weatherization installer, which is actually the bulk of the jobs. The second strategy is the high road um, agreements that Green for All has been a national leader on. These are usually done at the municipal and project level. They've been done for commercial construction um, and are now being taken and moved into energy retrofit work. And what they do is they put a wage standard on work um, and um, require contractors to pay that minimum wage. And they attach a local hire agreement or some mechanism to open up access for disadvantaged workers. OK. So turning back to the. Um, the last piece of research that we're going to talk about today, and we couldn't cover everything, so we really had to pick and choose here. Um, but going back to look at the skill and quality issues that might get in the way of achieving our energy efficiency goals. We weren't able in our inventory of training programs to really make judgments about whether the skills taught in these programs met employer needs and quality specifications for energy efficiency work. So we wanted to dig a little bit deeper, and we did this through really qualitative case studies and talking to a lot of folks, a lot of folks in this audience. Um, 
And what we found is that there are a lot of concerns about the quality of energy efficiency work. This came up repeatedly, particularly in the ener uh, residential energy efficiency and HVAC sector. So let's talk about HVAC. I know my HVAC buddies are out there in the audience. Um, it's the single largest contributor to peak energy demand, and as Commissioner Grunick said, it was called out specifically for restructuring in the strategic plan. Historically, utility energy efficiency programs have really focused on incentives that are based only on energy efficiency rating of equipment. It's only recently that they've started to focus on work quality, which is equally important um, in terms of getting our energy savings outcomes. 30 to 50 percent of new HVAC systems in residential and small commercial are estimated to be improperly installed. The quality work specifications exist, but in inspections show that a lot of installers are not following them. So what's going on? What is the issue? Is it an issue of skills and training? The biggest issue is that quality and skills are not rewarded in the residential and small commercial markets. A really familiar story for those in the field. And what the business literature calls this is a low road market. Low road means a market where firms compete almost exclusively on the basis of price. This leads to all kinds of cost-cutting measures, illustrated by the fact that less than 10% of HVAC changeouts uh, in the residential and small commercial market are done with a permit. Ducts aren't properly sealed, and equipment isn't sized right. In contrast, a high-road market, like in the large commercial and public HVAC, that's one where firms are able to compete on the basis of quality. And they adhere to labor practices that reward workers according to their skill level, which encourages training and enables employers to retain a trained and professionalized workforce over time. One of the biggest issues with the low road is that it creates high turnover and discourages investment in training. Workers are not motivated in, to invest in training if higher skills don't lead to higher wages. Employers don't invest because it costs money and workers don't stick around. Worst of all, public investment in training, which is often considerable, is wasted if a large percentage of the workers are leaving the industry each year. In HVAC, we've heard that turnover is as high as 25 to 30%. So what, what it comes down to is that although training is important, you can't train your way out of the low road. To create a high road market, you need to close off the low road. And since utility incentive programs alone aren't enough to really drive this market, transforming this really well-established low road market in the small um, commercial and residential really takes the combined efforts of state and local regulators and industry cooperation. Number of efforts are underway, and we're seeing really a big shift. The Western HVAC Performance Alliance is an industry task force that's trying to take leadership on closing off the low road. The Energy Commission and the State Contractors Licensing Board is conducting sting operations on permits and uh, license and unlicensed contractors, there's new training for building inspectors, and there's strong technician and contractor worker certif uh, certification requirements in the new IOU quality installation and quality management program. These will help, and we'll see how far we can get. We may need to go further, more stringent licensing requirements that are based on competency tests for contractors and require continuing education, and perhaps even licensing of technicians, workers, as well as contractors, like in the, in the electrical field. So which path will we take? HVAC, I think, is a cautionary tale for all the other sectors and really highlights the importance of attaching strong standards when incentive programs and new energy savings technologies are introduced. 
The problems that plague HVAC also affect the, whole, the residential market as a whole. And the challenge is really to how do we carve out a home performance market with higher quality? Energy Upgrade California is our new major statewide program that is just being launched, and it has taken the quality issue seriously. But it's also concerned about costs and about dampening demand and not meeting cost effectiveness tests. So it's taken, taking what I would characterize as sort of a middle ground approach here in terms of its approach to quality by requiring certifications for several skilled technician jobs, but not all job categories. In contrast, the DOE skill standards we mentioned earlier are broader, covering all field jobs. And they were actually developed um, because of concerns about quality work. And high road agreements which were developed to support our workforce goals are also being supported because of quality concerns. Now, whenever wage standards come up, people raise the concern about the cost of projects and the dampening of demand. Um, they've worked on big, big commercial and public. Can they work on in other sectors? Um, the literature, the research on prevailing wage projects shows that total project costs really aren't higher, even though wages are higher, because of the higher productivity of skilled workers. The jury is really out here um, in terms of looking at the costs and the outcomes, both in terms of our workforce goals and in terms of our energy savings goals. This is a period of <coughs> tremendous experimentation. If nothing else, ARA is going to teach us a lot about what um, what we really can do. So our recommendations, we have two very broad high level recommendations. Um, the first is on the labor demand side, the energy investment side, the economic development side. Encourage the development and adoption of skill standards and certifications to build the high road so that quality can be maintained and workforce planning can occur. And second, in terms of workforce preparation side, we need to um, continue to improve our planning and coordination among the major education and training institutions so that training can be both demand driven and leverage all the various components of our infrastructure. In a little bit more detail, energy efficiency policy and programs should explore options and costs of encouraging standards and certifications. What are the tools at our disposal um, for incentive programs requiring third party certifications um, for contractors and workers in our contracting processes, um, employing best value contracting um, processes that really value a documented history of high quality work documented ongoing investment in worker training and compliance with licensing building permits and employment laws. For residential retrofits, I'm going to stick my neck out here a little bit because um, I know there is, uh, there is difference of opinion here, but I do think California should consider adoption and adaption of the DOE skill, uh, skill standards that are just rolling out. Um, so that workers know and have portable standards and so that we can make sure that the, the lowest level of workers are also uh, trained and have a chance to get a little bit higher wages. Um, we should review our contractor licensing procedures and make the necessary changes to ensure competency-based licensing and stronger enforcement. We need to monitor wage levels and turnover rates and really assess the costs of low road versus high road for energy savings goals. And if IOU and publicly funded programs are generating low wage jobs with no career ladders, then we have to think of policies that can address that. On the recommendations for workforce preparation, um, we need to green existing long-term occupational training um, and focus on incumbent upgrade skills training, 
We need to promote system-wide collaboration, and a key area for this is community colleges and apprenticeship programs. Sometimes this is smooth, sometimes it's not so smooth, and we actually have a panel on this this afternoon. We need to create stackable certifications and credentials tied as much to these developing industry recognized standards. And during the recession, um, if we do get a lot more federal workforce dollars, consider wage supports for on-the-job training linked to certification. Um, and in closing, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be me if I didn't say something more about information needs. We really need to, to have the ability to track outcomes of training programs. Um, the, the data is there in the EDD, but we can't get it out. Um, that takes a policy change. We also need to track work, workforce outcomes of energy policies. Um, we also need to really build our capacity of those with deep knowledge of both the energy um, sectors and workforce. And I hearken to a proposal that the state of California is pushing the a na creation of a national center for the clean energy workforce that would address research and technical capacity building um, for the clean energy workforce. So, that's our presentation of our results. Um, you guys don't look like you're asleep. We have a few minutes for questions before we have our last morning plen plenary. And maybe say who you're addressing it to. Um, there's a mic. There's a couple people with mics. Um, May, why don't you start and see if we can. Um, I don't have my, I can't see that far, so I can't okay. even hardly see faces. So I'm Jean Clinton with the California Public Utilities Commission, and um, I'm on the climate strategies program policy side. Um, tremendous amount of insight presented here this morning in a very short time. Um, but there's one finding that I've, is striking to me, and I think it, it should, it could potentially underlie a lot of the conversation here, on, and it, it seems to be negative. So I, I want to I check this assumption, uh, and it goes to Karen. Um, my takeaway from your findings were there are not many jobs on the horizon in this clean energy space that are going to need people to be trained to go into them. You're talking about a handful of a few thousand, if I understood your presentation correctly. And that seems to me counterintuitive to what I would have expected. So I guess I, I, I have two curiosity questions. One is, is this based on current levels of, of spending and programmatic activity? And perhaps if we're aiming to double or triple the intensity, maybe that would lead to different conclusions. Um, and secondly, uh, I'm wondering if that view has been, if there's been a chance to sort of fact check, validate that with the employers of the world to see if they would concur with those numbers. Because if the numbers are that small, this is a whole different discussion in my opinion. Well, there's a lot of questions in that <laughs> question. Thank you. Um, so we are, um, again, this is all based under assumptions of what is currently planned for 2010, 2015, 2020. Something could change. We, I mean, we, we could invest a lot more, and then we would get a lot more jobs out of it. So, um, but this is based on what is uh, what is planned to be spent in public, and uh, policy-driven private investment. Um, this is uh, uh, the the numbers again. This is this is a very small piece of the green economy that we're talking about. This ener these energy efficiency programs, the IOU programs, the, the California Solar Initiative, the Title 24, we itemize all that, but there's a lot more work going on generally um, it, that is related to clean energy um, in the state. And so that's why we see the, the bulk of the training need coming for the, um, the workers that are working in a variety of different industries that just don't happen to be funded by these particular programs. I'd like to just add one thing. Remember that our big number of all the jobs created by this investment is 211,000 by 2020 person years? No, in that year. In the state. In the state. So, but what that means is that 
and we've seen this in, in other studies, is that when you do an energy efficient, any public investment, what you get is jobs in the sector that you have direct investment in, and then you get jobs in the supplier network that creates inputs for those sectors, and then you get jobs because all those folks are getting wage income and business income, and in the case of energy efficiency, energy savings on their bills, and that circulates in the economy and creates jobs in restaurants and clothing stores. So they don't need green jobs training. So I think it's really important to recognize that the green job, then there's all these incumbent workers who can take these jobs. So the number of new trainees is answering a different question um, than the number of total jobs created. I just, I, doesn't seem to be very loud. But the national study on workforce training needs for energy efficiency also found that the number of new jobs is, very, is not very large. It's the incumbent workers who really need to be trained, trained and that's what uh, this study is also showing. It's the incumbent workers that need the training. And there are new jobs, but there aren't as many as we would all wish and hope for. It's that the incumbent workers, there's just a large pool of incumbent workers that can do most of the work. So, uh, Ruben Lizardo at PolicyLink, thank you for the study and, and all the great work. I wanted to actually get on to that point that you just made about the incumbent worker. And we saw a few slides back, Carol, the example you gave about how to grow a high road uh, sector regionally or in the cities that included the local and targeted higher set aside. And I wanted to know, if you see that as part of this here as well, given this point that was just made about uh, the amount of jobs, uh, the folks that are already in the incumbent workforce that could, could be doing that work, and how, if folks on the panel will talk a little bit about that, because from a community standpoint, that is a huge priority for us in terms of our bringing our political force to bear to actually grow the sector. Um, well, I, I, that is on the workforce preparation side, but it's also even more on the folks designing investment and implementing investment. And so certainly, you know, um, our role as researchers is to lay out the trade-offs. I think certainly high road agreements um, benefit the workforce. We think they may benefit the energy savings goals. We don't think we actually have all the research uh, in place to make that summary judgment and the cost considerations and passing the cost effectiveness test that's binding on these policies um, is an important thing to look at. So high road agreements for our workforce goals we think have a proven rack, track record. Is there a trade-off or are they compatible with, um, with energy savings goals? We need to test that, and we don't have the data, and, and the, um, we, we really need, I mean, that's why I, I said the research outcome. Uh, I mean, the needs for research. Hello. Hi, my name is Jody London, and um, I think I'm the only local elected official here. I'm a member of the Oakland School Board, so I'm here representing K-12 education. It's kind of a big mantle to wear, but before I joined the Oakland School Board, I have 20 years of experience working in the energy efficiency industry at the PUC for Commissioner Grunick before she was a, commun a commissioner in a lot of different places, and I do a lot of work on behalf of local governments in the energy market, I represent a group called the Local Government Sustainable Energy Coalition. And we're the only statewide group that intervenes with state energy regulators. So my comments are kind of informed by coming from these two very disparate perspectives, but I think I'm unique in knowing these two industries really well. And the first thing I wanna, and these are more observations, the first thing is that the elephant in the room for me is that a lot of the programs you're looking at are funded through the public goods charge, which is up for renewal next year. And we don't know what's gonna happen with that in the legislature, so I think that's something that, you know, we need to be mindful of. It could, it could go up, it could go down, you know, I, I just don't know where it'll go. I'm sure some of, there are others in the room who have better predictions on that. Um, 
And then I always love it when I come to an energy forum and people talk about K-12 education and how great it is to get into the classroom and do curriculum and have, and have these technology academies. And I agree that all those things are great. But right now, the average school district in California does not have staff. In Oakland alone, last, for this fiscal year, we cut $120 million, 650 jobs. So the, the chart that showed that there's an increase in jobs in healthcare and education, that was the healthcare piece. And when we lay those people off, they come from every sector. It's teachers, but it's also a lot of the people who these unions represent who do our grounds and custodial work. Oakland is one of only 39 out of over 1,000 school districts in Oakland that has, a, in California, that has a green building standard. We use CHIPS as our new building standard when we're spending our capital bond. But until school districts can walk the walk in their own facilities departments, and they, because kids are really smart. So you can go in there and educate them about CFLs, but if that's not happening in the classroom, there's a problem. So that, that, I just, those are kind of the flavor of my reactions, but I think what you're doing is great. Thank you so much. Do we want any reactions? I think that was very well put. And Hi, my name is Cheeto Kahai, and I represent the Los Angeles Community College District. And just as a general comment, I, I didn't see from the slides how you all addressed starting up new businesses. Uh, I heard a lot about job creation, but maybe there should be more focus on helping businesses start up or increase in size. Because we recently did a poll with certain employers in our region, and they all told us that if we could use some of our technical training grants to train more individuals, not just the technicians, but in sales administration, just like your slides mentioned, then they would create more job orders and, and be able to fill those job orders with new technicians. However, those same employers, those same small employers said, if we, if they were able to expand their businesses, then they could multiply and germinate throughout the region and hopefully impact the economic, economic vitality uh, much better and faster. So any comments on that? Why don't you, Karen? Well, I, I would just say I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, the, I think that this, if you're thinking about job creation in the state, then, then we have to think about um, startups and small business and entrepreneurship and, and doing the training that's appropriate for that. Um, we didn't look at that in this study, but it's got to be part of the policy piece. There was, there was just one comment on, on the school district piece, and I just want to reiterate and support her issues. Uh, I work with a program in Southern California where we actually have worked with the local school district to develop a career pathways program, and it's on energy. It's not just green. We wanted to have a broader perspective because we wanted to have more than just a few employers involved, but a number of employers. And one of the, the concerns that we ran into right from the start was the fact that the district really didn't have the support to help us with it. So what we went out and, 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 and started doing was worked with uh, Southern California Edison, utility workers, got with the community college, Maricopa Community College, and then everyone dipped in a little piece. And so we expect in the fall of 2011 to actually have that career pathway and start doing some of those things as far as putting the information and knowledge from the utility, putting it into the district with the community college uh, really gaining because what we're doing is starting a pipeline. We wanted a pipeline to the community college because overall, there's not enough people with the technical skills to go into the utility industry, period. So my wish is that we could use those kind of ideas to help some of that funding as far as creating jobs, not just for green, but for all of the, the overflow into the fact that an electrician is an electrician, and we need electricians, and we need test techs. Well, if they're working in those areas, connecting with the utilities, that, that the funding will be able to support more than just the green. So collaboration, it for me, was the answer. OK, we have time just for a couple more questions before moving on. And we will have um, a little more time at the end of this um, session. So um, hi, my name is Meg Vasey. I'm the executive director of Tradeswomen, Inc. And um, I think the, uh, just to reiterate, the uh, workforce projections are probably the most important message that I've heard so far and need all the teasing out that people have looked at. But one of the things I'd like to raise is in, I did not see any um, 
any research that addressed uh, gender equity in your report in any particular um, development, and I'd like to know why that decision was made and whether or not there's some redress to that. I mean, I'll just, you know, 67% of the, of the um, minimum wage jobs in this country are held by women, women heads of households. I don't need to go into the details. I just remind you a touchstone of how important women's economic um, participation is to the health of our families and that um, the issue of, of um, good jobs is critical to women. Yeah, I, I, we agree with that. Uh, if you notice, all the panelists thus far this morning have been women. <laughs> but <laughs> we, so we, we actually cover this in our labor supply projections, and it is really striking the gender inequity in green jobs in the energy efficiency sectors uh, because these are construction jobs. Uh, you have very, very high concentrations of men in them. And we talk about that in the report. Thank you for the feedback. Um, let's take one more. Uh, I see Jim Hussey there. Thank you. Uh, Jim Hussey, Marina Mechanical. I too was surprised by um, kind of the, the number of jobs that were projected. And speaking as an employer, I would love to hire more people, because hiring more people means that we have more business. The connection here is you know, we, we're focused on how do we train people for these jobs, but to create these jobs, ultimately, a homeowner or a business owner has to make the decision to purchase energy efficiency. So one of the pieces that has to be part of the discussion, possibly outside of this group, but one of the pieces has to be how do we free up the dollars that these building owners and homeowners need to purchase these surfaces so that we can hire the folks that we've trained. Now, the uh, PUC held a symposium last month. It was a two-day symposium where they invited people from the finance community to come and talk about how to free up funding to do these projects. And I think they're congratulated uh, for, for their effort to do that and just encourage the community to continue to consider including in the discussion the people that actually purchase these services and are going to create these jobs. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So one more uh, final round of applause, and we're going to transition into the next panel. <clears throat> so while the next panel comes on, we are going to ask you to think about the following. And where's Larry Frank? Are you uh, down here? Larry Frank. Many of us know and uh, love Larry Frank. He's the deputy mayor of LA, but he had a great idea that I want to share with you. So we're asking you to do the following in anticipation of um, this afternoon's workshops. There will be 10 workshops. Some duplicate from the morning to the after, from the first session to the second. However, um, we are trying to try to get as much feedback going into those workshops to provide to the moderators as possible. So please look over during the next, before lunchtime, please look over those workshops, think about the ones you want to go to, but also think about the outcomes you have and the, um, the questions you might have to inform the workshop. Before lunch, I'll stand up here and collect your cards. There's two note cards in each of your binder things. And so if you have any questions you want to make absolutely sure are addressed in your workshop, Please specify the name of the workshop and um, come give it to me and we'll give it to each of the moderators to make sure that your issue is uh, fully addressed. So thanks and now we're gonna transition into the next panel. I know people haven't had a break yet, so Carol, should we just go in or do you wanna do a two minute? Let's do a two minute, but only two minutes. So do a quick uh, bathroom tea break. Come back in five. Five minutes, thanks. So people are asking about the PowerPoints, and they will be up at least on our Don Vial Center at UC Berkeley. Just Google that, um, and we'll ask if the, P if the PUC is going to put them up as well. Okay, so 
I was very excited about this panel because this experience embodies our two big recommendations. Set the strong standards and certification requirements and then do the workforce planning to leverage assets um, and be demand driven. So I'm going to turn it over without much ado because of shortness of time to Bernie Cotlier from the Nas National Electrical Contractors Association and the IBEW. Labor Management Coordination Committee, Barbara Cox, a certified electrician, IBEW, NECA as well, and Doug Avery from Southern California Edison, who's in charge of the Advanced Lighting Controls Program. So thanks a lot, everybody. OK. Uh, good, good late morning. Uh, once again, coming from Southern California, I'm up here, and, and I was actually born in downtown San Francisco, but I'd like to hear a little Northern California energy to get this started, please. Good afternoon. Hey. OK, uh, we're really honored to be here, and we're going to share with you a program that is already in place uh, with incumbent workers. And we're going to basically tell you uh, why we did it and w what the benefit is. The reason we're all standing is this is such a, uh, a team effort that we have to be getting up and sitting down. So we're going to kind of blend our, proposal, our, our presentation for you. Hey, do we have any energy problems in the country? What do you think? OK. Uh, there's a lot of federal and state mandates saying that we're going to be saving all kinds of energy by 2020, 2030. How many of you really believe we can do it? Put your hands up. Do you believe we can do it? OK, a lot of people don't have your hands up. Why not? OK, I'm, I, I'm going to tell you that we do have the technology today to do it. The technology is here. What we probably don't have is the wherewithal to install it, to make it work properly, and to have owner-occupant acceptance. And we're going to be talking about how, how we're going to get there. What needs to happen? OK, right now, Title 24 is about 1.1 watts per square foot for a uh, commercial office space. Uh, Edison and PG&E and the other IOUs, we've been doing research for the last four or five years looking at the effects of advanced lighting controls and a well-designed lighting system. Uh, what does that do? So instead of the 1.1 watts per square foot, we're finding that with the proper controls, we're actually hitting about 0.5 watts a square foot. And oh my god, we actually have good quality lighting. People can actually see to do their job. What a concept, OK? Uh, how are we going to get there? Well, there's a bunch of hurdles right now. And some of the hurdles are, are very real. Uh, most electrical contractors today do not understand advanced lighting controls, how they work. All they know is that every time they go to put them in, there's a lot of callbacks. They don't work. You know, something happens. The facility owner says, hey, why do I, why you guys keep coming back? Why can't you put it in right the first time? Uh, so what happens? They overbid the project. Uh, any of you ever heard of something called value engineering? Okay, what's the first thing that goes? Lighting controls. Okay. Uh, and once again, it's not a fault to the contractor. Uh, this technology, some of you have been following LEDs. Uh, LEDs, month to month, have exponential gains in, in, in efficacy in, in the ability to work. Uh, lighting controls are the same way. Uh, even though uh, I'm, I'm kind of fond of saying lighting controls are, it's like we've just come over the Sierras, and we're looking, there's this whole big plane out in front of us. And that's where we're, we're right at that place with lighting controls. And it's going to make a huge difference as we move forward. Uh, right now, systems are put in. They're not put in properly. They're not commissioned. They don't work the way they were designed. And Ira here, it's his facility. The minute people start having to do this to do a Delbert to get their lights on because the oxy sensors aren't working, uh, or you know, Matthew gets a call saying, hey, my lights aren't working. It's too hot. It's too cold. What do you do? You shut it off. You disable it. And if you were to go into most buildings today that have lighting controls, most of them, probably a very high percentage, 80 or 85 percent of those controls, have been disabled in one form or another because they just aren't working. Uh, by the way, this is Molly and Zach. These are my very, very smart dogs. 
Uh, I showed them some of these manufacturer's instructions and they didn't get them either. And these are really smart dogs, okay? The, the problem we have is a lot of these instructions are really hard to follow and they're proprietary and from one company to another to another, it's different instructions. The contractors haven't known really what to do. So, is this where we change, Bernie? I think it is. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to be dancing back and forth and hopefully we'll do it smoothly. Well, I want to thank Doug for presenting the challenge so descriptively and humorously. You know, it's easy to follow Doug because he sort of releases the tension in the room. Um, the challenge I have is to explain to you what we did to address the challenge that faces the industry and challenge that faces how to save energy. And lighting is the single biggest load that we have in our facilities. And lighting controls represent the biggest single opportunity to save energy. So with all the problems that Doug outlined, the question was is, what is the solution to this, to this challenge? How do we go about making this work and making it work well? Well, the first thing we did is we looked at a industry partnership as a solution to address this. Because it's very difficult, as we all know, to address problems disparately or in pieces. So we looked at what could we do to bring the industry together and who would make good partners in this industry partnership? What were the criteria? And some of those criteria were that the partners would recognize this as a challenge, first and foremost. If you don't see there's a problem, why would you want to be involved or do anything about it? That the goals were shared by the partners that they had high standards, and this is very important because Doug just explained that without those high standards of installation and operation, we're not gonna achieve the energy efficiency goals. Another critical aspect is that they have the enthusiasm to make this thing happen, and they have some resources to contribute, and that they're willing to commit on a long-term basis. We think these are all critical aspects of an industry partnership. Oh, back to the dogs. So then we looked at how do we structure an industry partnership? What do we do to put this together? In journalism school, they tell you when you write an article, you gotta address all these issues, who, what, why, when, and where. Well, we had to do the same thing. We had to look at all of those things and also who would provide the resources, including the funds. We were very fortunate to come together initially with a core group that, first of all, founded this organization. And I have to thank, thank the California Lighting Technology Center at UC Davis and their director, Michael Saminovich, for introducing Doug uh, to me and me to Doug. And we formed this three-founder partnership to launch this organization. We were then very fortunate to have Pacific Gas and Electric and other utilities and other partners like the lighting and lighting control manufacturers contribute resources to get this partnership off the ground. Then we had to look at who could be the working partners to make this thing happen. Because just getting a bunch of people in the room saying they want to do it doesn't get it done. So we looked at who's actually going to make this happen. And what are the qualifications and criteria for making it happen? Well, once again, we needed those shared goals and enthusiasm for making it happen. We needed the partners, the working partners, to have the same high standards, even more critically here, and to be certification friendly. And we think this is a very important factor because without certification, how can we be sure the work is going to meet the standards that are gonna get us the quality work and the quality installations and maintenance that will achieve the potential that these controls and other equipment can offer to us to save the energy. Certification is inc incredibly important. And then we looked for working partners who had a high level of trade specific training. Translated, that means we we're an electrical industry and we needed electrical contractors and electricians who knew what they were doing and had the experience and had instructors who were experienced as well and had the expertise to get it done. We needed well-equipped training facilities and administrative, and administrative resources, and we looked to the community, our partners in the community colleges and our partners 
in the electrical training centers around the state. Many of you know them as JETCs, the Joint Apprenticeship Training Committee Training Centers, of which there are 23 in the electrical industry in California. And last but certainly not least is the willingness to work and work very hard because it is not easy to do this, to take something from nothing and create an industry partnership, translate it into a curriculum, get the training going, and get people to participate. This is a really hard thing to do, and so people have to be committed and willing to work hard. Okay, so then we, ha we looked at what will be the structure and the, the plan and the roles of these members of this training program, this workforce training program. Well, we had a great partnership which was expanded beyond those founders that I mentioned. It included the other investor-owned utilities, uh, including San Diego Gas and Electric, and SMUD, one of our biggest and most progressive municipals in the state. And their role was to realize these energy savings. Lighting manufacturers, their role was to have their components installed correctly, make them work, save the energy, and get feedback from the field. Our engineering partners at UC Davis at the CLTC, the Lighting Technology Center, testing components, helping us with curriculum, and on-the-job feedback into the program. Electrical contractors, developing new markets, more projects, and more happy customers who aren't doing the Dilbert wave. Their systems really work, and they really save energy, and they get the return on investment. Community colleges, their role was a new level of training for workers and being a total partner in this program. And the electricians, their role and their benefit was more jobs, good jobs at good pay with benefits. So, Barbara. So how, how do we put this all together? Um, one of the things that became very apparent very early on is that we all occupy different universes, and while we may be located in the same quadrant of energy efficiency, engineers and electricians and researchers do not speak the same language. And that comes out in um, wiring diagrams for manufacturers that are unreadable in the field. Uh, the print is too small to read up in a ceiling. Um, those particular types of issues. The other, um, because we have that different language barrier that we have to get past in order to institute training, we need to make sure that everyone coming into a training program really is at the same level. So what we're talking about here is technical prerequisites. And our uh, manufacturers, uh, we have 14 advanced lighting control manufacturers, they provided our online prerequisites, which are a requirement for enrollment in the program. Um, takes somewhere between four and 12 hours to do the online prerequisites. Very necessary because then the instructors in the classroom are not spending time lecturing around terminology. Um, they get to focus on training. Um, uh, and the other piece that was needed is that there really wasn't a very good feedback loop for researchers and engineers and manufacturers into whether the particular components were not functioning properly in the field because they weren't installed correctly or because maybe there was something wrong with the component. Maybe there was something wrong with the design. So now we have, cl we have closed that circle a little bit to allow that feedback of what actually is working and it is not working. So we have a really clear idea uh, about what the most effective um, technologies are. Okay, back to me. Uh, I might add, uh, the group that I'm with with Edison is the Design and Engineering Services. And our, our main reason for being is proof of concept. Uh, new technologies come out, do they work? You know, or is there something that needs to be done? And we probably see anywhere from 100 to 200 manufacturers each year that come in with my product, okay? Um, through, and I, I've, been, I've been doing lighting, oh, since my beard was brown, I could see my feet, okay? It's been a whole lot of years. Uh, in that time, I've learned that most of the control systems aren't put in right. Once we have these electricians trained, there's some huge advantage. There's some serendipity that's going to occur, okay? 
First, we're going to have a foundation of trained workers. And, and keep in mind that this is not entry level. These are journeyman electricians that we're training. In order to be in this program, you already have to have a license. So we're going to be training people that, that are already professional electricians, but they may not understand the controls and how they work. Um, so it's going, to be, it's going to be less cost. It's a little faster ramp up. The class we have now is a 50-hour class. We expect a 20% failure rate. It's a tough class. But when the guys come out of it, they really know what they're doing. Uh, here's where the serendipity is going to come in. Uh, as a utility, everyone wants to come see us for their incentives, right? You put in your, your, your energy efficiency, you can get an incentive from us. Well, where does Bill's Barber Shop or, or Polly's Pet Shop, uh, if they have an energy, they need new lighting or they need something, what do they do? They call their local electrician. And the chances are very likely there's a utility. We're never going to see that. We're not even going to know it happened. And right now, because the electricians don't have the knowledge of advanced controls, they don't know how they work, they're not comfortable with the technology, it's not being sold. They're putting in the old T8s, T12s, whatever they can put in. My belief is that as we train these electricians, we're going to have a whole lot of guys out there that are entrepreneurial, they're anxious for business, and they're going to be out selling green. They're going to be selling these advanced controls, putting stuff in, in a way the utility never would have seen. And hopefully, uh, the utilities are working right now on an incentive to uh, put a kicker on a custom program now that if you're a certified electrician, we add like $100 a KW to that incentive to the customer if you're certified. We want to kind of condition that market, and we're working on doing that now. Uh, I think what's going to happen is you're going to get an awful lot of electricians that are pushing from the ground up, from these small, non-participant customers that we've never touched before, and we're going to start seeing a lot of stuff become more mainstream rather than the exception. Uh, and of course, bottom line is we think this is going to create a whole lot of jobs for the numbers that were showed in journeyman electricians, whether it's how many hundreds or thousands of them that are out of work. We think this is going to create work. Is this still mine? That's still yours. It's still mine. Okay. Big, once again, the biggest bottom line is if it's put in, is it working right? Uh, you're running a business. You're not running a light. You're not, you know, some of us, I walk in and see how the lights work, the controls. You don't care. You just want it to work. You want the bottom line. One of the things that I, I've already, we're, we're doing a lot of tests right now in advanced lighting control systems. And we put in uh, some systems we're putting in. Edison's investing a couple million dollars, actually, in a number of projects. We're using certified trained electricians to do these projects. And we just finished one with Brookfield, which is a very large property owner. Uh, Every project has problems, right? And Brookfield, guaranteed, was a wonderful, uh, engaged partner. Okay, they were real tough to work with. They were very demanding. We didn't have, we did not have, an, uh, we didn't have a hitch. I went to the foreman of this job, who's been through the training. I said, "Okay, you've been through our training. You know, you got your certificate. How did it help you?" And he thought for a second, and he said, "You know what?" He said. I kind of understood the wiring. Some of the low voltage stuff it was good to learn. He said, but more importantly, I knew why I was doing it, what I was doing, what, it was, supposed to, you know, what was supposed to happen, and what the whole thing was about. He said it made it really easy. And he loved it because he understood what he was trying to do. The results of that, gang, and this is a big deal, we have 2,000 watts connected load. We've been measuring it for four months, metering. We're averaging about 400 watts a day with the proper controls. That's how we get to our energy savings. That's how we're going to make those goals 2020, 2030. Brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's still some more. They're, they're not quite through. <laughs> OK, the tag team continues. Uh, I talked a little bit about certification before and why it was important. but. Ooh, we're on the wrong slide here. Uh, I want to talk a little more about certification because we think that it's difficult to say too much about the importance of certification. Energy efficiency equipment of all kinds, not just in electrical industry, is sophisticated equipment. And it requires sophistication and expertise to be installed correctly. So the question is, is how do you know that the person who's going to install this or the company that's going to install it has the training, has the expertise, 
the way you know it is because they went through the training, they took the exam, they passed it, and they've got a piece of paper. I mean, imagine if the University of California at Berkeley didn't offer diplomas. What a mess that would create in our society if we didn't know who graduated from college and who just said, I'm educated. Well, it's the same thing with these trades. So they give us a lot, cert certification gives us a lot of advantages, and it's absolutely critical to energy efficiency. It standardizes, first of all, who gets into the program. It's the utilities who required that we only allow journey level electricians into this program. That was a utility requirement. Secondly, it assures the technical competence of the graduate. It assures ongoing te technical competence through continuing education requirements to continue their certification. Exams are required and their secured exams. And then what we did with Cal CTP is something that I think is, if it's not absolutely unique, it's relatively unique. And that is, is that we built a three-part certification into the California Advanced Lighting Controls training program. We realized it wasn't just the electricians who had to be trained and certified. That we first had to educate the contractors, the business people, about how to market, sell, publicize, and manage these projects. That's the business development know-how. So they have to go through a class. Then we realized that the middle management has to understand these projects because when they get the plans from the specifiers, the architects, the designers, if that particular engineer or architect doesn't know that much about efficiency and it isn't designed correctly, who's going to be first line of defense? when it gets to the contractor. Well, if those middle management people aren't trained, it's going to go right to the field. And in the field, they don't have any authority to change it or reject it. So we train the middle managers and certify them, and of course, the electricians. So for all those reasons, certification has been critical to the effectiveness of this program and to the effectiveness of really saving energy in the field and in the facilities. For those of you who ever, have ever written a grant on deadline, you know that you really do not want to reinvent the wheel. So what we did is we used the contractor state licensing board requirements for a certified uh, C-10 electrical contractor, and we used the uh, Department of Industrial Relations Division of Apprenticeship Standards state certification for general electricians as our baseline. Those are existing regulations. And I want to step back a little bit because the word certification and licensing is used by different folks for different reasons. In this particular instance, in California, we have licensing for contractors and we have state certification mandatory for electricians. There are a number of classifications for electricians. We are specifically focusing on general electricians who typically have had 8,000 hours on the job training and 2,000 hours of classroom instruction and have passed a proctored state exam. So that's the baseline. Um, in addition to that, on the electrician side, as I told you earlier, we have the online prerequisites, mainly to condense the amount of time in the classroom. Now, the lecture and lab for CalCTP is 50 hours. 80% of it is pass-fail demonstration. You learn about a new um, component or a new system, and then you have to install it, and you have to install it correctly. If it's not installed correctly, you do not go on to the next module. This is not a rubber stamp certification program. If you cannot correctly install these, you will not pass the lab, and you will not sit for the final exam. You may take the class over, but this is not a program designed to just shuffle people through. This is, in fact, an actual certification program. On the contractor side, again, building on that licensed C10 contractor, um, the business development course um, is a one-day course for upper-level business owners. We want folks who are making strategic decisions about the movement and the direction of the company. Um, the technical course for their state-certified electricians. The technical course is only available to state-certified general electricians. The system course is available to mid-level managers. And in order for these, you know, anticipated utility rebates, in order for the utilities to certify a project as CalCTP certified, 
the contractor will have to be certified and the electricians working on the job will also have to be certified. So what we have done here, uh, as uh, previous uh, speakers have spoken about, is that we have really linked the certification to the work. And now on to the wonderful world of grant writing. Um, uh, Aura Monday began to, uh, proposals began to flow out in May of 2009. Uh, the CalCTP Collaborative actually was in place in 2008. It was an existing program that we were working on. Um, we already had curriculum in place at 14 uh, joint apprenticeship and training committee electrical training centers throughout the state. Uh, and we also had 30 certified trainers in place throughout the state before ARA funding came out. Um, and that, that's a big distinction because we had a program that needed expansion, not a program that needed development. Um, at the time of the application to the Department of Labor Energy Training Partnership grant, um, unemployment was at an aggregate about 30%. And what that means is in some areas it was 20% and in some areas it was and still is 50%. Um, most of the federal funding that was uh, released under ARA required public-private partnerships. We had one. Um, and it also focused on unemployed workers. Um, as we were successful in our Department of Labor grant, uh, we expanded to the community colleges. Um, the program is open to all state certified general electricians. Um, uh, we found that we, some of our contractors came back to us and said, look, the folks who are going to be organizing these jobs, the supervisors in the field, they're working and they're not eligible to get into the programs that you have going because they're just for unemployed workers. So we went to the California Energy Commission and the um, Employment Development Department through their Clean Energy Workforce Training Program and secured some additional funds for those contractors to train employed um, uh, workers and also to uh, train new hire workers. Um, this is one of my, for those of you who know me, uh, one of my major sort of tangents that I go off on, and, and that is that there is a difference between workforce training and workforce development. From the construction industry side, we respond to demand in the marketplace. Forecasts about attrition rates, uh, the, the gray tsunami, we, we are aware of that, but we're not training people if there are not jobs. In an apprenticeship program, an, apprenticeship, uh, an apprentice is matched with a journeyman on the job. If 30 to 50 percent of those journeymen are not working, there is no place for those apprentices. This is a really crucial point for our partners as we move along, is that it requires journeymen in the field to train the new workforce entrants coming in. And we all know what the demographics of the state are, but if journeymen aren't working, apprentices don't have a place to go. Um, and so one of the reasons we focused on returning high skill workers back into the workforce is we know that it's gonna open up those slots in apprenticeship, and that was very, very important to us. Um, one of the reasons we brought in the community colleges, uh, and, and we work with them on a number of, of different um, partnership uh, agreements, um, is that only about 30% of apprenticeship applicants actually pass the math and reading exam. Uh, that is atrocious. Um, and when we look at um, expanding diversity in the ranks of the IBEW and among NECA contractors, um, that's simply an unacceptable number. Uh, because if only 30% of the applicants are coming in, uh, you start looking at the, the various sectors of the demographics are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so we need our community college partners to assist with preparing apprentice applicants uh, for apprenticeship. Um, for uh, young people who are out of work and people who are cha changing their career, um, you know, apprenticeship is about starting low skill, earning while you learn, and, and moving on into a high skill career that has compensation and benefits. Um, we do an enormous amount of outreach locally throughout the state um, with CBOs, uh, social justice groups, environmental organizations, really trying to reach out and partner. Um, the picture you see here is a IBEW NECA Green Jobs Corps um, program that actually started as a grant-funded program to train 18 to 24-year-olds. 
but part of the grant required that the 18 to 24 year olds uh, engage in community service. We had a project labor agreement with the Alum Rock School District um, and in exchange for the uh, project labor agreement, uh, part of our community benefit uh, requirement was that we engage with the students on clean and green technology. So we had the 18 20 to 24 year old Green Job Corps members then go in to teach fifth graders with our staff acting as um, sort of the master instructors, and we engaged and energized. Uh, the, the project was designed, we were not funded as a partner. We incurred all the cost ourselves. Um, originally, we were to uh, do a class of 20. Um, the teachers came back to us and said, we can't pick 20 kids. You're going to have to do them all. Um, so we have done three uh, classes now um, at the Allen Rock School District. And we now have uh, a bunch of fifth graders who are very engaged and energized about uh, energy efficiency, about looking at the trades as a career option. And to my mind, fifth grade is seven years or less to workforce entry. And we really need to start thinking in those, those terms. Um, and finally, I think you know, we need to maintain realistic expectations about um, a demand-driven industry. One of the numbers that showed up earlier was the, uh, the person year. Uh, the Department of Labor de defines a year of employment as 2,040 hours. Um, in the construction, in the electrical industry, it's 1,980 by collective bargaining agreement. So we need to be very clear that we define terms as we have discussions with partners because we may think we're saying the same thing and we're actually not. Um, and in that Department of Labor grant, we actually had an exemption put in uh, when we showed them that that was actually the terms that were uh, the ones in which we were operating under. Okay, uh, we're running out of time, so we're going to go very quickly through these last couple of slides. Uh, we just want to point out that what we're talking about not, not only applies to advanced lighting controls, which has been the focus of this dis discussion on this training program, but it also applies to all the other subsectors of the electrical industry, uh, energy auditing and energy efficiency, retrofit construction, renewable uh, generation, demand response. Uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, power transmission, facility-based uh, energy storage, and the voice data video networking category. It applies to all of these, and it applies, of course, to other trades as well. Yeah, we have to do this little thing. Um, lessons and challenges for other, um, other sectors. Um, utilize existing state certification and licensing regulations. They are extremely helpful. Uh, they've been done. You don't have to make them up. Uh, you know, it, it's always a good thing to design a program that complies with the law. Um, start your training early. Um, <laughs> And make sure that you are looking at solution-driven workforce training, which means you have identified a problem and you all agree on what the problem or challenge is. Um, set the standards as high as you can. Um, involve as many industry stakeholders as you can. And make sure that you engage manufacturers. So in summary, what, what we learned that we're sharing with you and we hope uh, will be helpful to many other training programs, existing pro programs, and prospective training programs is that we first of all had to identify and understand those challenges to create a major impact and to do this market transformation that we've been talking about. We had to understand the challenges. We had to get that formation of a core of industry leaders. We had to pull them together, all the key stakeholders. We had to do the brainstorming, do the consensus building. We had to develop a consensus-based training plan that the industry agreed on. And then we had to pull a core team together that would do the work, make sure that we had the right people doing the curriculum. We got found the funding. And I want to, uh, at this point, give special recognition to Southern California Edison because they put in roughly a half a million dollars to make Cal CT happen. And they deserve a big hand of applause for that. Uh, and finally, of course, the drafts and the redrafts and all the work that we talked about before uh, to, to get the right program. And then the last step, which is really the first step in the training, is to implement it, to do the outreach, do the marketing, and make sure that you're having an impact in marketing, getting those 
uh, all those folks trained. Before we go to um, questions and discussions, I just want to thank Commissioner Grunick and the Public Utilities Commission, uh, Carol and her team, and everyone here for giving this opportunity, giving us this opportunity to share the California Advanced Lighting Controls training program today. Thank you. Thank you so much to that excellent panel. We have time for just two questions, and then Tori, who organized this conference, will be uh, transitioning us into the afternoon. So right here, Ira. Uh, Bernie, could, could, could you uh, uh, mention uh, briefly but specifically how you partner and what specific ways with the community colleges? What role do they play? When do they enter into the partnership? Is it after the apprentice comes and displays a, a lack of proficiency? How does that work? Okay. Well, first of all, the community colleges were a partner early on. Uh, they were, uh, as soon as we formed the, um, the founders group, uh, they, were, they came into uh, the, the uh, coalition with the other members, the other utilities, so they were very early. Uh, we worked directly with the chancellor's office, and they were very enthusiastic and uh, helpful, and we've worked closely with them all through the process. Now, in terms of, of the role, uh, the community colleges have, have many, many roles in terms of training. Uh, they do uh, train uh, electricians and they train contractors, and one of the most important roles we feel that the community colleges offer is the pre-apprenticeship uh, training, because in many cases, unfortunately, our high school graduates don't have the math and uh, English skills and other skills to, uh, to pass the entrance exams for apprenticeship, and community colleges have been very helpful and very important in that role, and we appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Barry Sedlick. I'm chair of the California Green Collar Jobs Council. I had the great privilege to tour the IBW facility uh, in commerce and, and bend uh, Barbara's ear on the program, so I was very much uh, uh, excited about the quality and the sophistication of the training that's going on. But I have a question more specifically for Doug. And that is, you talked about, you know, the, the needs for the certification and standards. But one of the issues we really haven't heard you talk about collectively is the issue of accountability and responsibility. It was mentioned, for example, that the architects may not uh, uh, specify correctly. And so there seems to be no one in control. To what extent do you think that if there was a system of uh, moving towards uh, performance-based guarantees or performance-based contracting, that somebody is responsible, not just for getting the equipment installed and checking off the list, but if there was a contractual agreement that said, this is how this, this equipment is going to perform. It's going to not exceed a certain level of, of uh, energy consumption. It's going to provide some minimum level of uh, illumination and so on. So that the burden then goes on to the, the company that is providing the, the overall system to make sure it performs so we don't get that Dilbert wave, that somebody is responsible for doing this, and that becomes the driver of being able to make sure that the training and the quality of all the installation and, and the systems are done correctly. How, how would you respond to that? Uh, happily. Uh, <laughs> uh, Barry, good question. First, there is uh, a person that's responsible right now. It's called commissioning agent, which is basically a very underused and underutilized person in that, in that chain of retrofits or new construction. Uh, I absolutely agree. We do need to have someone that's saying, hey, you know, I'm the one that's ultimately responsible. We're going to have performance. I think that the utilities have a role to play uh, as we look towards new incentives. Uh, one of the challenges we have is how do we incentivize a system? I know if I put a lamp in, I know what that's going to use. If I put in a ballast, I know what that's going to use. But how do I take these systems, which are going to be tremendously variable? Uh, it depends on what the building, how it's operated. And uh, uh, some of the, you know, I think if utilities come up with programs like pre and post metering, and it's based on the delta between connected load and what you actually use, maybe something like that. And once again, this is, this is all blue sky. Uh, we definitely need to educate our architects, our lighting designers, and our building operators. You know, low first cost isn't necessarily best cost. And when we start demonstrating that with proper installation of good lighting, and good lighting controls, we can save 75% of the connected load. 
uh, and, that, and that's on an ongoing basis, and people are happy in their environment, it's going to start making that happen. Who that person is, Barry, right now, in the industry, there's a commissioning agent. That's exactly what they do, and once again, totally underutilized. Uh, did I dance around your question, or did I answer it? Oh, and engineers. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, my name's Tori, and that wraps it up from the morning session. Lunch is outside here. Uh, they're sandwiches. And at 12.30, everyone needs to come back in here because we're going to have our lunchtime speaker, Chair Karen Douglas from the CEC. So um, I want to just go over real quickly uh, the afternoon schedule. Uh, from 1 to 2.30 is our first workshop session. And then, from, then there'll be a break. Uh, 2.45 to 4.15 is the second workshop session. And then everyone's going to come back here to the Crutch Theater at 4.30. And we'll have the Next Steps panel um, and comments from the policymakers. 5.30 out here in the hall is a reception. And we really want people to stick around. Um, I just also want to point out in the schedule, um, 1A, 1B, and 1C, those three workshops will repeat in the second workso workshop session. So um, have a great lunch. Come back at 12.30. And oh, one more thing, if anyone has any questions, you can give these to me or to Lisa Oyos. These will be given to the moderators later. Thanks. <laughs>